Hello, everybody. Welcome to our work session of June 22nd on a Wednesday, uh, which is abnormal for us. So thank you all for joining us. Um, I'm going to start by calling the work session to order. Can I have a motion to open it? So I move to open the work session. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, we are going to start our work session today by hearing from our illustrious state assemblyman, Chris Burdick, who is coming to just update us on uh, what's going on up there in Albany. Thank you very much. And are we live here on this? We're live. Good. Excellent. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And um, it's really an honor to represent uh, Newcastle. And I'm quite pleased that even with the newly drawn district, uh, I could, would continue to be representing Newcastle. And so- We are very pleased. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. It, it's really an honor and privilege to represent the town. And the last time I was here was about six months ago. It was at the end of November. And so I'm here to provide an update since then. And legislative session, just so you know, is over now for 2022. Like most state legislatures, we're a part-time legislature. We run from in New York State from the beginning of January through the first week of June. And it has been a very productive session. Um, I think it's been one in which we've done a number of very good things for the uh, residents of the state and for this district. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit first about local funding because especially coming out of local government as I think you know I was town supervisor of Bedford for seven years and so I'm very keenly aware of the need for funds from a variety of sources and especially from the state and I was pleased that last year I was able to secure the $125,000 grant uh, toward project costs for a new inclusive playground and to refurbish two town tennis courts at Millwood Park, uh, as well as for the installation of a new security system at the train station. And I'm now working with the community, as I'm sure you know, to see whether something may move forward in two different areas. One is I'm acutely aware of the issue with regard to the generator for your water system. And that I would put at the very top of the, of the need. Having heard that it's over $30,000 a month that you have to pay in order to have the generator. And so I can tell you that that's something that State Senator Pete Harkham and I are very interested in doing whatever we can to help you with that. That's number one. And I, I feel cautiously optimistic that if we can identify a source for the generator, which I understand is an issue, that we will do our utmost to figure out a way to help you with at least a portion of those costs. So that's something mm -hmm. that I, I do want to let you know. And we're going to get you specs on that generator. Yeah, you can get ASAP. me the specs on that, and we're going to do we're going to try to help you folks with your public works department and such uh, to see what we can do to see if there's some way of identifying, uh, you know, a generator. I understand that supply chain issues are at the center of the problem that you have here, but nonetheless, whatever we can do to help, we're going to. Um, also, something that um, has come to my attention, has been brought to me, is uh, Buttonhook Forest. And uh, that's something that, as I understand it, uh, the school board, uh, they had a contract with a developer that the developer, as, as it's been conveyed to me, uh, was unable to receive their permits in order to subdivide the property. And as such, that contract is not going forward. And the school board is open to getting bids from uh, other possible purchasers, including the neighborhood group the and, and friends group that wish to acquire it. Um, I think it's a very interesting project, and it's something that I'd like to be helpful to the town if it's something that the town is interested in pursuing. 
So I just want you to be aware of that. There too, I am working with State Senator Pete Harcum uh, on possible funding sources. And so that's something I also wanted to mention. One of the things that I've also been fortunate to be able to do is to uh, get funds for community-based organizations that uh, help our county, help our communities, and um, such as the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center, Girls Inc., the Community Center of Northern Westchester, The Loft, Hope Store, uh, Latino U College Access, and others. And there will be more this year that I will be uh, securing funding for. But now taking a more macro level look, which is the New York State budget, and it's a, I think, a fiscally sound budget, and one which I think has done a really good job in providing for the state. And I put at the top of that list public school funding. This is the biggest commitment to public education ever. Every school district in my assembly district has, is getting an increase under the new state budget. For the Chappaqua School District, the total support level is over 10 million, 10.8 million. For those in the Ossining School District, and I will provide a written report to you folks, um, it, it's some 49 million there, and you'll see with the other school districts that, that to which portions of Newcastle students attend. The state in doing this is fulfilling a historic commitment to fully fund what's called foundation aid, which is the basic aid for public schools. And it's being done in three budget cycles. Last year was the first. This is the second. It will be completed in the 2024 state budget. And the state of aid is so important to provide the continued excellence of Chappaqua schools while also helping to hold down school property taxes. So I'm very pleased and proud of the role that I could play together with my colleagues in bringing that over the finish line. We also recognizing the pain that people feel at the pump. Um, we have going, it went into effect actually on June 1, a gasoline tax holiday from state gas taxes, and that goes through to the end of the year. And that's estimated to save motorists over a half a billion dollars statewide. Another area that we've acted upon in talking about taxes is a middle class tax cut. And this accelerates the phase in of middle class tax cuts that began in 2018, saving taxpayers $162 million that was in this current state budget, and even more in the next budget. And just so people know what we're talking about in terms of middle class, we're talking about joint filers earning from 27900 all the way up to 323200 So these will be the lowest state tax rates in, for the middle class in 70 years. So I think that was a significant accomplishment. Again, talking about money coming back to our municipalities, um, my colleagues and I in the Westchester legislature uh, uh, pushed very hard for robust funding for the New York State Department of Transportation. And I'm pleased that the new $32.8 billion DOT capital plan is, represents a $9.4 billion increase, or 40 uh, percent increase over the prior five-year plan. And most importantly, money coming to the municipalities. And so funds coming for the Newcastle roads, and I confirm this with the DOT regional office, for CHIPS funding, 338,000, it, it, just a little over that will be available. Extreme winter recovery, 65,504. Pave New York, 76,209. And a new program called Pave Our Potholes is going to be 50806 That's and for Newcastle? That's for Newcastle. And I, as I say, will provide this in writing to you and am very happy to work with your controller or your uh, public works department on any questions that they have on this. 
Um, and also, I can tell you that I am working with DOT, the regional office, to address deteriorated state roads that we know are here in Newcastle. And I am pushing on that as well. Have you heard anything from them? Um, we're working on it. Yeah. But <laughs> I, I've been, I, I can tell you that I, I have been working with DOT for many years. And, you know, I was successful in getting DOT to pave a section of 684 that hadn't been paved in 40 years. And you may notice that they have newly paved, starting at the uh, 684, all the way from the south end, all the way up to exit 5. And that, too, was based on pushing. Not, not just myself, but other supervisors um, and, and, and mayors in Westchester County. DOT takes time. But we have to be patient, but we have to keep pushing. I can tell you that. And I can assure you that I keep pushing. Um, I'm going to very briefly touch upon a couple of other very key areas in the budget. The environment enacted budget uh, provides a record $400 million for the New York State Environmental Protection Fund. And I want to point to a really important referendum that's coming up in November. It's the $4.2 billion clean water Clean Air and Green Jobs Environmental Bond Act. It's going to be on the November ballot. $1.5 billion for climate mitigation, $1.1 billion for restoration and flood risk reduction, $650 million for open space conservation and recreation, $650 million for water quality projects. These are all critical areas. These are things that are dealing with both infrastructure, creating green jobs, and doing major improvements for throughout the state and virtually every municipality. Mental health services, uh, over $50 million increase. There's a homeowner tax rebate credit that also was put in, $2.2 billion, and that's a one-year property tax rebate. And look for your checks. You should have gotten them by now. Um, affordable housing, a $25 billion five-year capital plan for 100,000 affordable housing units, including 10,000 supportive housing units. Libraries, another area where the Westchester delegation had worked very hard to get funding, especially for the construction uh, program under the State Education Department. Um, there was also a utility arrearage fund of half a billion, uh, I'm sorry, 250 million for those that fell behind uh, in, in especially given the skyrocketing rates that we've seen with Con Edison. Veterans is 7.6 million in restoration funding. So all in all, in the budget, it's been very, very uh, good budget and one that I feel is fiscally sound and looks forward. And as your controller can tell you, we don't use money that we get from Washington for recurring expenses. We use them for one-shot deals, recognizing that if you've got a program that's continuing, you have to have a continuing source for that. The legislative session ended very strong. Those uh, who follow it may know that um, there was a package of gun safety legislation that was uh, enacted and signed into law Really very simple. We need to keep guns out of the hands of the wrong people. In addition, we increased funding for mental health programs since we know the connection all too often between people who go out there with semi-automatic weapons and massacre people, and they uh, often uh, need mental health help and and. It, it gets covered over, and they don't get it. I also am very proud of a, a package of legislation which the governor signed that protects reproductive health care rights. Uh, and, and one of those is actually a bill that I introduced called the Fire Hate Act, which is to protect those coming to New York State for either reproductive health care services or gender affirmation services. 
And I, I want to give a, a shout out to Kristen Browdy, who authored the initial draft of that, Newcastle resident. She can be very proud of the role that she played in bringing this about. Then we took that uh, idea and developed it into legislation. We, of course, negotiated with the governor's office, made changes in it. It was signed into law. And that, I think, is extremely important to preserving and protecting the reputation that this state has as being a safe haven, a safe harbor for people who want to come to this state in order to receive these services. Another piece of legislation that I was able to get over the finish line is one, uh, uh, one of my constituents came to me to broaden the definition of sexual assault on a child, and that was passed by both houses. I also had legislation to strengthen employment opportunities for people with disabilities, two bills that um, did get across the finish line to uh, work with uh, what's called the preferred source uh, provision of the New York State Finance Law, which will lead to increased employment for those companies that are doing business with state agencies but provide jobs for people with disabilities. Um, lastly, that I will mention, and again, I'll give you a fuller report in, in the written version of this. Um, I was able to get across the finish line a wetlands protection law that would be available for those municipalities in New York State, and there are about 70 of them, that have adopted freshwater wetlands law pursuant to the New York State environmental conservation law. And it will give those local governments the authority that they didn't have before to adopt a local law that would uh, enable them to prohibit the application of pesticides in wetlands within their borders. So that also passed um, both uh, chambers. Um, I am here to serve the community. I cannot overstress that. Whether it's individuals with their problems, whether it's the Department of Labor, Department of Motor Vehicles, I even have people, who, even though it's a federal issue, they'll contact me about a passport. We are there to help. And I can tell you that my staff and I try to be as responsive as we possibly can. I also consider that my role is to help every one of the nine municipalities, their elected representatives, and in any way that I can, whether it's grants, whether it's trying to deal with state agencies, getting approvals from state agencies, working with our partners in the federal government, I'm here to help. And I just want you to know that's how I perceive my role. And with that, Jeremy, I'm sorry, I went over four minutes. So, <laughs> but any questions? So first I wanna thank you for being a real partner with Newcastle. Um, you know, we met, as you know, you were there a couple weeks ago uh, to talk about other issues that we're having um, in town, both with DOT that you alluded to and, and other things that we could use help with. So really appreciate you being just a phenomenal partner um, with the town of Newcastle. So thank you. Um, one quick question I had, which I know a, a lot of residents are interested in, is what has happened, if anything, with the future of TOD or ADU legislation? Great question. Um, just to very briefly go back, uh, transit-oriented development and accessory dwelling unit legislation initially had been part of what the, of the executive budget, meaning that uh, the governor put it in her budget. As, and, and the reason why it could be done that way is there's a provision in the Constitution that allows her to do that. Well, I heard from a number of municipalities, including Newcastle, that they didn't think this is a great idea. And I want to say that I do feel that accessory dwelling units can be a very good tool but I feel, and again, coming out of local government, that that's something where the local um, municipality has to have the control over it. 
-hmm. And I had a problem, especially where you have towns like Newcastle that have been for years making efforts in this area. That I think that I think there's only one municipality among the nine that I represent that doesn't have something in their zoning code that encourages the development of accessory dwelling units or affordable housing generally. So I, you know, um, I support the, there's no question, you heard me speak about how much I felt that it was important that we have a robust budget statewide for building affordable housing. And in fact, as a member of the housing committee, I argued for getting an increase in the amount of that capital plan. And there was a slight increase in it. But I don't want to dictate to the municipalities how they should be going about it the way that it was. It is dead for 2022. Gone. Because the legislative, first of all, it was taken out of the executive budget. It did not come up legislatively. And um, I attended a hearing of the Housing Committee front and center. This was the topic. It did not get a good reception. And I would be astonished if it were to come back in its present form. There might be something, but I am more one inclined to the carrot rather than the stick. I'm much more inclined to incentivizing municipalities through grants or whatever it may be, and, and to incentivize private property owners on that. But I have a real issue where, in effect, what you're doing is you're eliminating the single family zoning district statewide. And so I had a problem with it. And, it, and I think that it won't go forward anywhere near the form that it's in, if at all. That's great news. Thank you. Probably yeah. more of an answer than you wanted, no, but perfect. I know exactly. that it's a hot topic. Yes. And I've had a number of, not just Newcastle, who said, that idea. So, and I love Pete Harcum. I've known him for 20 years. I think his interest in this was absolutely sincere. He moved this forward for all the good reasons. But he and I differ on this one. All right. Thank okay. you. Other questions? Anyone else on the town board? Well, I'll ask a question. Sure, uh, First please. of all, I, I want to echo Lisa's thanks and gratitude to you for coming here. And, you know, you're a busy person and you've taken time to come and speak to us. And I'm sure that uh, you didn't have enough time to go over all of the things that you've actually done. So I look forward to uh, reading your written report. Um, I can't help but bring up the school funding issue. Mm -hmm. And I hope my colleagues here forgive me. I spent like 10 years on the school board and working regionally for school districts, and it does affect most of the taxes that our, our community, you know, bordering on all the different school districts do pay. So um, I think it's great that the Foundation Aid formula is being fully funded. I just wonder if you know anything about um, our, our look, a reopening of the actual metrics that are used in that formula. So to give you an example, uh, we are part of a regional cost index that includes Westchester and goes all the way up to Ulster and Sullivan counties. So that's the cost, how the cost of living is calculated for us here in Westchester. And there have been many arguments saying that we should be included in the cost index with New York City and Long Island. So that um, has a great impact on the funding that we get in this area. Um, also, there are metrics for um, ENL and ELL students. So for instance, the metrics that are used are from the 2006 census data, where you know at the time when I was doing this, 2010 data was available. And now I'm sure the more recent data is available. Um, and another example, and I won't go on, this will be the last example I give you, but ELL students, for instance, are counted as half of a student when calculating the extra costs that are associated with providing services. So there are many metrics within the, the formula that also need to be looked at. And so it would greatly impact our, our community here, not just the CCSD, but Austin and you know other districts that I, you know, uh, was very honored to represent, such as Peak Skill, Yonkers. Um, it would impact so many of our districts here in Westchester. Um, so since I have you here, and it, it does affect all our taxpayers, I'm just wondering whether there is any opening to look into those metrics. Uh, I can tell you this, that um, 
I, I did not see within the 2022 legislative session a concerted and a concerted push for this, number one, nor would I think that there's a consensus on that. That said, again, I go back to what I said, that I'm here to represent my district. And that is definitely something that I'm happy to have further conversation with you. And I think it's very important that we get some consensus within Westchester County on that. Because it's one thing if one member of the assembly says at 150 says, we think that this should be changed in this way, but it's gonna to need to have some broad-based consensus that changing the formulas, uh, and especially if it's really Westchester centric, you know, whether we're gonna be successful in that. It's Westchester centric, but, Westchester Putnam. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm just trying to tell you, that doesn't mean that I wouldn't be willing to champion it. I'm just trying to explain that in order to really be able to get it forward, there would need to be a willingness statewide to accept that. Um, not impossible. I mean, look, it wasn't that long ago that people said, I don't know whether foundation aid will ever be fully funded. And so things happen. And by pushing, things happen. And so I would be delighted to speak with you about that and see whether we can get support, you know, um, through the county and through other legislators and see what we can do in the coming session. Great. Thank you. Sure. I, know, I know it's a difficult issue. No, and listen, really thank you for asking the question. It's, it's a very good one. Anything else? All right. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for your time. Thank you. Very much um, appreciated. Chris, I would also love to see if we could get you in to come talk to our, our seniors at sure. some point in, the, in our community center. Um, I think they would love to hear from you as well. I, and, I would love to do that. Especially as it's, you know, senior-based maybe sure. um, issues. Yeah. No, I would be delighted to do that. And uh, why don't I, offline, you know, Perfect. find yeah. out, you know, what's good for them, and I'll do everything I can to get there. Perfect. Yeah. Listen, thank you again. It's Great. always a delight to be here. Chris, before you go, I'm going to just give you a very uh, a personal shout-out and not to take anything away from any other state legislator because they're – we're very fortunate, but you are probably one of the most responsive uh, individuals I've ever worked with, not just professionally here, but professionally in terms of my livelihood and career as an attorney over the past uh, 22 years in government and outside government. And I want to thank you, um, whether we agree on everything or not, although we do routinely agree, um, you're responsive and you, you try to put us in the right place. So thank you very much. Well, I appreciate those kind and gracious words. and. Listen, I love the work that I do, and coming out of state, you know, out of local government is so much of what um, prompts me and gives me tremendous satisfaction to, to, to try to help and to try to deliver. So thanks so much for that. Thank you. So. And, uh, just to let you know, yeah. your, your staff is following up with us on the 29th. We've got meetings on staff levels to take and move some topics along that we, uh, that we jointly discussed when we were meeting with Lisa. So Excellent. Just no, to let that's you know, great. all that stuff is going on behind the scenes. Super. Well, thank you. All right. And, uh, we'll be in touch. Thank, thank you so you. much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, hope I, I hope I didn't hold you guys some now. I don't even know if we're going to have somebody in front. Thank you. Take care of that. Thanks so much, Chris. All right, um, so moving on, yes, you are next. Uh, we are going to have a discussion next about a proposal that's come into the town board uh, about 50 North Greeley, um, which many in town know as the former Rite Aid space. Um, before we, we call you guys up here to do that, I just wanted to say a few things to the public. Um, certainly, we are looking at... Uh, we're actually happy that there's been a real renaissance in, in our downtown right now, specifically the Chappaqua Hamlet. And this, we want to continue that. And, you know, our plan is to actively solicit, I have some notes here, public feedback later this year on um, public spaces and how best to achieve that with a charrette on a much broader scale for other areas of, of town. In the meantime, we do have this incredibly exciting proposal that's come before um, the board. 
And um, I think it actually accomplishes many of the things that during our um, during our master planning process came out as something we're looking for. It uh, would be over 10% affordable as far as I'm concerned or as far as I understand. Um, it would be sustainable, which I will let you, I'm not going to steal all your thunder. Um, it's going. also um, on the edge of downtown. I, I do want to make sure, though, that the public realizes that this is coming in. We we are going to consider it as a, as a town board, but we certainly want to make sure that there is significant public input on this. So we will make time available to ensure that um, the public knows about this process, has the ability to uh, give us their thoughts and opinions, and I'm sure that you'd be willing to consider those as well. Um, it, it is not something the town board is, is pushing through, the, through to residents. Rather, we want this to be collaborative, both as a process with residents and, and all stake owners in town, with the town board, and with a developer who's come in with a, with a, a very interesting proposal. So that being said, with that introduction, I want to, to welcome you. Thank you very much. Um, Lisa, we're meeting the person for the first time, so we've met on the phone. Yes. Um, I'm going to just introduce the, the presentation first and uh, who I am. I'm Don Feinberg. I represent my family, and we own the property and have owned it for 50 years. And uh, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to present. But I would like to myself give background as to what motivated us to actually want to develop the property. So just a little quick background. When my dad developed it, it was, uh, I think previously, it had either been a pickle factory or a golf ball factory. Um, and he was actually requested by Gristides, who had a small store, apparently on King Street, if they could have a bigger space. And the reason was that at that time, what my father saw and what Gristides saw would be, was that the finest, highest and best use for that, for that property at that time was to actually begin to cater more to commuters. So rather than small stores, have a big store with large parking. And I think even to this date, it's still the biggest single store, the biggest single lot in town, if I'm not mistaken. Second only to Chapel Park Crossing, right? So um, it is, I think at that time, it was a very, very interesting idea. And it was one that has served us very well. It's been a very successful property for our family. We're very happy with it. We've had great tenants, whether it's CBS, whether it's Christides, whether it was Rite Aid. We only most recently have been made unhappy by Walgreens, but Walgreens had to darken the store because of actually an antitrust, because they had, they had obtained Rite Aids, they had to sort of, they couldn't have two stores in the same market. So they darkened ours. But interestingly, our little Rite Aid was doing 50% over what the annual, uh, the um, average was nation, nationwide for, for Rite Aid. So it's been uh, something in our family, we've really done well with it, we're very proud of it. Uh, and we thought, well, you know, now that it's dark, we, we didn't really know where to go next. And about four and a half years ago, I think I got a call from Rob Greenstein, and he said, you know, we're thinking of basically changing the motivation about downtown, what kind of zoning we want to have, and to encourage development downtown. So all of a sudden we had an opportunity, we really had a choice between should we continue to just do rental, or do we have other things that we can look at? And when that opportunity opened up, we thought to ourselves, well, we would like to develop, and you and I have discussed this, but we don't want to do just an apartment building. We don't want to just do places downtown where people can live, although that's very needed. We really would only get into involved in such a complex project if we felt that there was something more that we could actually bring to it, something that would be meaningful for us as a family. And I think we sort of reflected on that as a family, thinking back, well, my dad's best thought that the best and highest use for the property was to sort of cater to it back in 50 years ago was a commuter. What do people want to do now? They want to live in a different way. They want to live in a way that's perhaps less car-centric. They want to have opportunities to actually leave large homes if, they've grown, if they're sort of aging out of them and live downtown and experience life in, in Hamlet and all the pleasures that really can come from that, mm -hmm. to be able to walk to, where you, to your commute, commutation, to walk to your um, library, to walk to your school. We're eight minutes from all those different places in town. So we thought, hey, we have a great opportunity. So we got together as a family and we said, yeah, we'll do it on the condition we can do something that, again, is meaningful and that we think really meets the moment now. And for us, our passion is, I will share a personal note with you, I've just become a grandfather. So our, thank you, makes me feel old, but also makes me feel more responsible. Um, we really want to look to the future and we think that you have to do 
uh, not only a building that is operates in a green way, but that is constructive in the green way. And so for us, we took the really the decision that, okay, if we can do a groundbreaking project here, something that will be a model for other people to see, something that can prove a point that you can actually build green and be commercially viable, we're excited about that, we're passionate about that. And that's what we decided as a family. And once we decided that, we realized that we have only one problem. I'm not a developer. I'm also not an architect and I'm not a planner. So I realized that I, we had to actually test that idea. Was it something we're excited about, but it's something that people know whether or not in the field that's, that's something that's feasible. And uh, I was very lucky to be put in touch with a very young dynamic developer who I know is also kind of a hard-nosed guy. His name is Jeff Davis. He's with me tonight. And I rolled it out. I basically said, this is what we want to do. Tell me why I'm wrong. And he said, I don't think you are wrong. I think it's doable. He goes, you know, it's probably not the least expensive way to do things. And it's probably not the only way to do things, but it's doable. So that was encouraging. We then took the idea, and we were very lucky, to Gray and Organsky, which are, who are leaders in the field of building in a green manner, not only, on, again, on the operation of the, a lot of people know about net zero and operationally, but carbon input on the actual building. And our interest was to do something called mass timber, which we'll be explaining a little bit. And so we were, uh, again, the same thing. We met with Alan and Lisa, uh, Lisa Gray and Alan Organsky, Alan's here. Andrew Ruff is also from the same firm. And we said, tell me what you think. Is it possible? What, what, are, we, what are we missing? Because we probably were missing a lot. And they were excited and said, we don't think you're missing anything. We think it can be done. In fact, we have experience doing it, and we're actually doing a low-income project in New Haven that's similar to this in terms of the type of construction. So that my ears perked up. If it can be for low-income, maybe we can actually do something that's commercially viable as well. So then lastly, we also had to talk to Planner. And we have with us Annette Warren, who's here. And Annette has worked with, uh, she's really your neighbor communities up and down in the Hudson Valley. And I think she may have even worked with Jeff Trump on this project. So she has lots of experience. So we were able to put together this team and we were able to sort of feel like they were telling us it was doable. We felt it was doable. And so the presentation we're going to, they're going to actually, Alan's going to give tonight, and Jeff is going to speak to tonight, I feel very strongly is something that can be a model not only for Chappaqua, something that you can be proud of, but then actually it'll be the, one of the first of its kind, not only in the tri-state area, but actually in the country. It's something that I think people will want to walk down the street to see. I think it's something people are going to want to actually experience when they get down that street. And some, it's going to be a place that people are going to want to live in as well, which is key. It can't be commercially viable if people don't want to live there. But we think both for young people who are less car-centric and who want to have a more pedestrian-oriented life, as well as older people who feel the same way, again, want to enjoy Chapman. We're passionate and think that that can be done. And um, that's what really has motivated us to put in all the work we've already done. It's been almost a year of work, actually. And that's what you're going to see tonight. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you, John. Thank you. I don't know how you go after Don after all of that. Um, that was straight off the cuff for him. Um, thank you for having us tonight. Um, very happy to be here. I'm very proud of the work we've done so far. Um, one of the things we want to point... Can you just say your name for the viewers at home? Jeffrey Davis. Uh, I'm part of the development team. Um, one of the first things that we do when we go into any development project is we meet with the community. Uh, we're not the type of developers that are going to push you around and tell you, here's what we want to do. We're going to ask you what you want in your community. This is your home. Um, I actually live a town over. So it's kind of my home also. All of my friends live in this town. So trust me, I've gotten an earful from everybody so far of what they want to see in this project, what they don't want to see in this project. So we are very well aware of what everybody wants to see as well as what we can work on moving forward and what we've done so far. So some of the things that we heard coming into this development and what you're going to see in the presentation tonight Oh, I'm gonna go taller, shorter. I can do anything. We're flexible. Yeah, sure. Or it doesn't work. I can. There we go. So some of the things that we're going to show you tonight in our presentation is the project should have 10% affordable in it. We're going to go higher. We're going to put 12% affordable in the project. Uh, 
when we came into the project, we we're going to have a small retail footprint. We've actually increased that retail footprint, um, which in this project, if you've seen the shape of it, is not so easy playing around with the footprint. But we're adding quite a bit of retail in there because I've been told that there's no diner in town. Everybody needs a diner. For good or for bad, we happen to have a lot of restaurateurs in our world, and we're going to pull from that and try our best to get a diner operator into the retail space. We actually, in the last three weeks, completely changed the ground floor footprint, moving the retail from the corner to make the entrance to the building better for the residents and making the open space in the center of the property so there's a really true great outdoor and covered outdoor space for the diner concept so that come rain or come shine, there's a place to eat outside that's covered because we felt that was something that the community has asked for and that would be great for the building and the community. Another concern that came up is parking. Everybody still wants cars, even though one of our goals is to reduce the amount of cars in the building because we feel that you're right near the train station. We want it to be a transient, transient, transit oriented development, but we've looked across the street and you guys have a beautiful parking lot right there that's really not doing all that much. So uh, I actually spoke to Lisa and said, why don't we sit down and talk about how we can better make use of that parking lot? What if we looked into making it a two story parking lot with a landscape sculpture garden on top? So and maybe we can screen it off so it doesn't look like a parking lot, maybe with an artist mural at street level. So when you're walking by, it looks beautiful and not just a bunch of parked cars, but now you have two levels of parking and you have a landscaped open space for the community on top. We're trying to do things that would benefit the community and not just do things that benefit only the residents and only benefit the developer's pocket because we're here to make the whole community better. Some of the things that we're going to do in the project being that we're so close to the train and we're right in downtown is in addition to trying to reduce the amount of parking we have for our residents and keep in mind we're doing this as a rental building people that are coming here knowing they only get a certain amount of parking for their units that's their choice they're choosing to live there they're choosing knowing what they get we're actually doing electric car sharing in the building we have a company we do business with you have two electric cars you can rent them by the hour by the day, um, there's been studies done by UC Berkeley that for every electric car that's in a residential building, it reduces the need for five parking spots in that residential building. I thought it was incredible when I read it, but I read it and read the subsequent studies. It does do so. If you actually think about it after this, how often your car sits there not being used unless you're doing carpool or something like that, or me, I drive more than anybody, but it's true. We also have electric scooter rentals in our buildings. We have a company called Tulu, where you can rent everything from a Dyson vacuum to a PlayStation for your kids, which is good because if they're good, they get it for an hour. If they're bad, they don't get it at all. You could rent the electric scooters. You can rent bikes. So we really are promoting the idea that you have different amenities that you can use so you don't need to use a car to get around and you can really use the hamlet as your amenity while you're living in the building. Another item that we're doing is we're taking the sidewalk area and we're expanding the sidewalk area by eight feet. We're setting back the building, we're setting back the retail on the ground level, so you have eight feet of additional sidewalk area for open space, for increased tree pit areas, You'll see it when Alan gives you the presentation. And as Don said, and Alan's going to take over because I'm not the one technical for this, the sustainability of this building, the mass timber construction, I'm going to let him go from here on this, but it's a game changer. Being a town that does this, that has the first building that does this, the continued net zero footprint is incredible. I build all over the place, New York, Florida, Jersey. We don't do this everywhere because the cost to do it, most people that develop, it's a significant hit. Having a partner that wants to do this and that's their first goal is a pleasure. So I'll let Alan take over and tell you all about it.
Thank you all. My name is Alan Organsky. I'm a principal at Gray Organsky Architecture, and I'm here with my colleagues, my four colleagues, but specifically Andy Ruff, who's a director in our office and is involved in all this research that went and goes into buildings like this, and I'm glad to have him here with me. And Andy, you should feel free to jump in if I mess anything up. Um, today, I just really want to talk about the architectural and urban character of this building, because obviously that's a concern of a town that is considering how to transform its hamlet um, and, and to create really meaningful public space that creates more vitality and vibrancy in a, in a downtown, even a small one while meeting all the other goals that we have, which is to try to protect the character of the overall town and the area, but also create more density in terms of creating more housing, which is a way to solve the affordable housing crisis, um, but also to really build a streetscape which people want to inhabit and use, and which it generates a, a kind of uh, a real power for the town uh, as a source of, of community, uh, and, and that's what the architecture is really about. And I can talk about the sustainability issues as well, and I should, but the first thing I want to note is that what's really sustainable in making a building is making it really usable for a long and durable for a long period of time. Um, and sustainability is a really important issue for a couple of reasons. Obviously, we want to take care of the planet. We want to protect ourselves from the, the uh, vicissitudes of climate change that we're already seeing. Uh, which will affect us, perhaps last in, on the planet, but it will affect us. Um, but also, just from an economic standpoint, if we don't build our buildings better and more sustainably, they become stranded assets for towns, for owners, for investors, and we want to essentially build buildings that are durable economically, durable in terms of environmental uh, capacity, and as, as I said, vibrant spaces. So. Here's our streetscape. This is, again, just a really early study um, that we try to visualize in a way that is more meaningful. Um, we're, we're creating a, a space for public amenity for, for the users, but also uh, retail space um, and, and a streetscape which is generous and broad uh, and allows us to uh, really expand the kind of green, the greenery and the planting that will make even the air better in the town. Um, you know the site well, better than I. Uh, 50 North Greeley is the home to uh, the now shuttered Rite Aid, and, and no, most notably in a town which has these incredible resources of a, of a train station and, a, and a, 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 a lovely little hamlet. Really what's most notable to me is when I come to this place as a visitor is that there's a sea of parking next to a giant infrastructure of a railway with another sea of parking behind it, and that really contributes to the character of that street space. And so our first goal, really, is to try to address that question of how to best utilize the site and bring it to its highest and best purpose. Uh, you know, this kind of planning of, that, was, that uh, Don mentioned is really a, a kind of dinosaur of a past idea that the car would be the answer to all of our problems, which we found that is the problem to all of our answers. Um, and so really what we're looking at is a site which is pretty challenging in terms of massing. Triangles are really hard to create any kind of uh, uh, systematic approach to making housing units. Um, and, and also uh, to try to cr create a barrier to the train so that the street itself is the focus and not the parking. And so on the ground floor, really what we're trying to do is create pockets of space. Uh, the red are, is retail space for a diner or for, for coffee shops or smaller, smaller stores. Um, the yellow are really the amenity spaces that are shared by the uh, occupants of the, of the building uh, and also the, 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 the members of the community. And then finally, tucked behind all of that is parking for 49 cars. And the idea being that by putting the stuff that you really don't want on the street at the back as a buffer to the train tracks, you essentially allow the front frontage of the street to become public-oriented. And so you know, from a plan, I'd just like to kind of run through uh, the planning idea. So you can see the Rite Aid, uh, originally Gristides, and, and the parking lot. Um, and really what we've done is taken uh, essentially the front section of the street and created this kind of crenellated or unfolded streetscape, which creates these little uh, street-level gardens. Um, the largest little public court you can see to the south is uh, bounded by retail space, so coffee shops, uh, diner, uh, different kinds of uses. Um, 
the to the very south along the Susan Lawrence building, there's a muse that creates one access point for a residence and the upper story housing. Um, there's an area for bike parking. And then there's at the north end, uh, 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 some more amenity space, gyms, et cetera, for the occupants, um, and another entrance lobby. There are three upper levels that basically break down the entire volume of the site to create courtyards that are planted with trees. They're, they're called, it's called intensive planting for a, a green roof. So these areas that you can see um, between, my cursor isn't working, but the areas that you see between each of the blocks of housing are, are green spaces planted and they overlook the public courts at street level. And this gives us some, some benefits. Obviously, we make the volume of the building smaller. It's broken down. It's got a lot of green space that floods around it. Uh, and it creates more surface area for better apartments that have better uh, exposures, better ventilation, natural ventilation, which is a big, and daylight, which is, a, of course, a really big part of sustainability. And then you can see essentially a mix of two bedroom in the, in the darkest uh, green. Uh, the lighter green is our one bedroom apartments and then the studios are in the white. And so it's a mix throughout all the floors to create a really rich and diverse array of, of housing uh, for different family and household structures. I'll note here that you can really see the kind of principle of how this is organized. And this is not something that developers really like, so I was grateful that Jeff and Don were willing to go along with it. But we essentially use a, a double loaded corridor which feeds all of the apartment blocks as they move forward toward the street. But you can see along the backside along the train station is a single loaded corridor. So that basically means that we're not making apartments that overlook the train track. That's the circulation space, the hallways that serve apartments that overlook the uh, courtyards. And so these are really special organizations. It means a little more uh, corridor space. Uh, um, it grosses up the building for a developer, but we felt it was really important to create the quality and to break down the scale. To add to that for a minute, you're going to ask us why we are coming to you with four stories. And the reason is this, because we're on train tracks. To put apartments up against the train tracks, nobody can open a window and nobody can sleep when the train's going by. So we took this approach of we can't put anything on the back, and we pushed everything to the front, and we built all of your flow towards the back of the property, and we added, as you saw, the bulk. There's no apartments on the first floor. We did. We added all of that retail on the first floor because we thought, if we're doing this, let's add all of this for the community to the first floor and make this all community-driven here and added all of those pockets of open space to the first floor, but we needed to put it somewhere else, so that's why... We ended up at the fourth by taking everything on the first, adding a community level, and then taking everything off of the back to be able to do something. So, you know, that, that creates that asymmetry that we're really trying to get, which is that it, the, by turning the, the, the window walls into the courtyard primarily and the long faces deep into the lot, we actually get smaller faces on the street, like less, less bulky, uh, and then we get pockets of green which contribute to the streetscape and not to the, not to the uh, train track. Um, let me just go back for one I second. Just want to, sorry. And, I mean, those courtyards are 40 feet wide just, to get, just so you get the yeah. scale. That's it. Yeah. They're, not, they're not itty bitty little things. So um, uh, another important thing about, uh, about sustainability is how you use building surfaces to generate energy, to polish stormwater so that there's less load on civil systems in the town. And so what we really try to do is use uh, garden roofs as a, as a way to slow water flow and to polish the water with the soils that are part of the roof system. Roofs are also a place where you can generate energy. Um, if in some future point we'll be able to actually collect clean stormwater and maybe use it for public water or ir irrigation. So the, the idea of actually controlling water flow uh, and using surfaces to generate energy are really important principles of sustainability, and this building will do that. So we're going to have PV photovoltaic arrays on the roof or solar thermal systems to try to supplement domestic hot water. We're going to be using the green roofs or the garden roofs and, and the courtyard surfaces as a way of, of, of slowing stormwater flow and cleaning that stormwater um, before it gets into the uh, civil system. Um, and then generally what that means is that 
residents who are looking from above down on the roof, they're not looking at, at, at asphalt roofs or rubber roofs. They're looking at, at uh, really a kind of uh, ecosystem of, of planting. And that's, that's a really important thing. That's good for insects. It's good for bird populations, pollinators, etc. So I showed, this is a little difficult drawing to understand. Um, this is a drawing, but it's important to see the scale of this relative to the topography and what it does in the town that you all know um, as the, the buildings climb up the, the, the grade of the hill to the east. So we have an elevated train track, which is above the street level, which contributes noise, uh, and, and also it's, it's unsightly. As a, someone who commutes on the train, I think trains are great, but it's really hard to live next to them. So what we've done, as Jeff said, is kind of load the parking against that. We've used the back wall as a buffer to the train track. We put the lower uh, uh, apartments that overlook the garden to the east, and we circulate in them along uh, corridors that are overlooking the train track or past the train track to the hills to the west. And then that means that all of the uh, apartments essentially look over the courtyard or over the street. And so that's, that's part of the kind of publicity of this building, that it's, it's making the building come to life. And this is also an elevation drawing, so it's a little hard to see, but you can see how it's, there's a kind of rhythm of buildings. Again, we're just really getting going on this, but, but we're creating tree uh, sidewalks that are large enough to have meaningful planting of, of street trees, uh, in little courts uh, that are inset that allow for more planting, and then those garden levels uh, floor above, which contribute to the, the general quality of the space. I mean, here's a, here's a blown up version that just shows a kind of schematic uh, sense of the scale and how we're trying to break down the scale of the building and pushing a fair amount of it back away from the street, allowing a, a kind of low uh, roof, gable roof to come to the street level um, and overhang that, that lower section slightly so that you get some shade uh, from hot west sun. And the material palette, we're really trying to look around the town and understand the kinds of languages. Uh, again, these are some really initial studies using some uh, engineered timber cladding, wood cladding, uh, and, and also uh, some brick, possibly recycled brick to match the kind of older brick character of the town. And then uh, the window walls are, are really made using these new engineered timber systems that we're really familiar with and we've specified on a range of housing uh, types. One thing, you notice that says diner in the window there, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that, that was, that's just been obviously been getting a lot of pressure about the diner. Um, and so, you know, here's a, here's a, just a visualization of it. Uh, again, opening the, the street uh, to, to these different kinds of planted uh, courts, elevated and otherwise, uh, trying to pull the scale down. These are, you know, we're working to try to reduce the scale of the, revenue generating three stories of housing, the 40, 45 units of housing, uh, but also to create a kind of rhythm and, and an, uh, again, study a, a language of how the architecture can contribute to the kind of character of a, of a denser uh, development. And I showed this streetscape idea earlier. And then the courtyards themselves, as I said, are planted pretty heavily, uh, and they're, they're public spaces that are contributing to the life of this, of this community, of the general community, but also the community of people in the housing. Um, and then just some different views from different locations. And you, what really happens is that the building serves as a buffer uh, uh, to, to the infrastructure of the Metro North Rail, and also just to try to turn the streetscape into a, a really, really positive experience. So I just want to quickly do some before and after shots because we're really trying to study this to get a sense of you know, the scale of the thing and how it works uh, on the site. And these are obviously bird's eye views. We're never going to see these this way, um, but it helps you understand the scale of, of these. Um, so these are uh, you know, looking from the far south, and you're seeing this sort of folded roofscape that, that is, a, is a kind of watershed, almost like a landscape. Um, Slightly a different view, turned a bit. And then, of course, it's really important to kind of pick up a pedestrian access along the, the from the north and, and absorb that into this, this kind of idea. And so essentially what we're trying to do is, is split that off and bring people down the main street of Greeley. 
you can see the, the building, the little connectors that connect the green roof spaces are actually those uh, one bedroom or studio zones with the corridors running along the train track. And so a bit about sustainability. I've talked a lot about power generation, uh, uh, electricity generation, uh, daylighting, uh, uh, green roofs, using the surfaces of buildings to, to take advantage of what we call ecosystem services rather than making mechanical systems do the work or electrical systems. You actually make the building surfaces do the work and take advantage of it. But we should talk a little bit about this kind of global issue. Um, and that really has to do with a lot of work we've done on this so-called mass timber, which is really old engineered timber systems that have been refined and now brought into the code to be able to produce urban scale buildings. You know, this is a low building for this, but 18 stories are allowed now in these mass timber systems by the 2021 International Building Code, just, just uh, ratified a, few, a year ago. Um, and that's an important thing to remember is that these are robust systems that have been really tested. And one of the things that we've really worked on is the fact that when a forest absorbs carbon dioxide, it stores it in the carbohydrate that is wood. That carbon that is drawn down out of the, out of the atmosphere is held by trees. And if you can successfully transfer ecologically, silviculturally, environmentally, sustainably transfer that material out of the forest rather than letting it rot, you actually can store the carbon dioxide. And so suddenly our buildings, instead of being carbon emitters, become carbon storage systems. And this is starting to tr track across the planet. Major metropolises, smaller towns are looking at this as a way to actually create carbon positive buildings. And I say this because right now it's understood that the building sector or the life cycle of buildings from the day we dig uh, limestone for concrete or, or uh, uh, dig up ore for steel to the day that we demolish the building and put it into landfill contributes to almost 50% of anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. Now, we used to think that the big deal was energy generation. So that takes place during that operational life cycle. But what we found is that there's a huge impact in the materials that we use and the, all the processing and transport that goes into it. And so what this does is offsets all of those emissions. And so what we found in our study and our work in housing in around, around this area is that a building that's four stories stores almost as much carbon or it's, I should say, stores more carbon than standing forests of the same area. Now, that's not to say we need to cut down forests, but now we can tr safely transfer, allow forests to be regeneratively uh, managed and regrown, and we can store their carbon benefits in buildings. And that makes you carbon positive, in other words, uh, carbon storing from day one, rather than having through efficient operation of the building to recover uh, uh, the initial impacts of building. So I, I just want to interrupt for one second. So just what you looked at, the design that we just showed today, would be the equivalent of 3,500 metric tons of CO2 in the building structure, which would be the equivalent of taking 1,000 cars off the road. Just in building the building. Yeah. And that's day one. Uh, and that's about, as, that's about as sustainable as you can get, honestly, because then the building will continue to operate efficiently for another 50, 60, 70 years. Uh, these are really durable systems, and we, we uh, hope that it can be an exemplar for building in towns and cities uh, in the future, and that uh, Chappaqua can be a real leader in that. So there's a lot of data here. They're on the sheets that we shared. We shared hard copies for everyone of this presentation. Uh, and I don't want to go into the details except to say that this uh, combination of, of the mission provided by Don, the real constraints that were levied on us by, by Jeff, Jeff. <laughs> he's tough, uh, and the real support that, uh, that we've gotten around trying to make this thing fully sustainable, create densities that, that are achievable um, and, and convivial at the same time. Uh, has been a really exciting project, and we really hope hope we can continue to partner with the town of Newcastle and the hamlet of Chappaqua uh, to make this thing a really powerful uh, answer to the problems of building in the 21st century. Thank you. One other thing, 30% of the project will be all new landscaping. Come up here, just because people at home can't hear 30 you. 30% of the project will be new landscaping, not just apartments. 
So 30% of it will be green space. So another little fact. Size a thousand cars off the road. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a. It's a little hard to see, mostly because for me, because I have bad eyesight. But um, the current impervious to pervious coverage ratio is a really critical piece here. Um, right now, the existing ratio Can is is 88 percent impervious to to pervious, uh, which is pretty high, right? That's all parking area. Um, the proposed ratio with just using the courtyards uh, drops to 65 percent. And if we go to a full green roof, sorry, can you just chuck the chuck from this? Sorry, say that last part again. Yeah. Um, so by Introducing the courtyards, the planted courtyards, we drop the impervious to pervious ratio to 65%. So 65% is, is now impervious. I'm sorry, could you repeat? It was 85%. 80, uh, 88 is the current uh, impervious surface, 88%. Courtyards drop it to uh, 65%. And what's really startling is if we use the extensive garden roof for the roofs themselves, we drop the impervious area to 20% of the entire site. And that has all kinds of ecosystemic benefits, air quality improves, uh, and most, most uh, importantly, you now have this reduction of stormwater impacts, uh, the slowing and, and polishing. So, so current, I'm oh, sorry, just one more time because yeah, I'm sure. a little dense. No, current no, no. condition on the property right now is 88% impervious. That's right. Without the live roof or green roof, yeah. it's 65%. Right. With the courtyards. Right. And then with the green roof plus the courtyards, it becomes 25%. 20. 20%. 20%. Thank you. So it's fairly significant. And again, that's uh, I'm just pointing that out because this issue of building surfaces and how you handle them um, are, are really important. And there's a lot of research that we've been working on and we've been looking at that even the materials that you choose to clad buildings can reduce urban, urban heat island effect, which is also a, a, an important uh, quality of life issue for members of the community. And, and this is all really just basic science that finally people are looking at with respect to buildings and applying it. So I just want to call your attention to that because I think that has a significant uh, role to play uh, in the development of uh, the housing. You love it. <laughs> um, I'd like to ask if you could, uh, oh, oh, just one question, um, technical question. I don't know who should answer it. Could you get a little more granular without getting too technical? I know I'm asking you to walk a line here. Um, in explaining the physics of the carbon storage versus usage in that cycle. Yes. Yes, we all remember from high school biology, or I try to remember, that um, the carbon cycle is made up of two parts. Um, photosynthesis, which pulls carbon dioxide out of the air and turns uh, that carbon dioxide in the presence of solar energy and water into, uh, into solids, plant cellulose, wood and trees, etc. So now that carbon dioxide has been transformed into a carbohydrate, uh, C6H12O2, uh, for you chemistry fans. That stays in the building, in, in the tree. And in fact, the tree, as it draws down more carbon dioxide, as, it, as the trees grow, it lays on more wood. And so larger trees have more carbon storage in them. Um, when you cut the tree down and you burn it for fuel, or you allow it to rot in a landfill, or you just leave it in the forest, either bacteria, fungus digests that wood and then re-emits it as CO2, because they're like us, we, in, we inhale oxygen and exhale CO2, they do the same thing. And so the other side of the carbon cycle from photosynthesis is respiration or combustion, where we burn the oxygen and the carbohydrate and emit it into the air. So essentially what we're doing is arresting the carbon cycle at the critical point where it could re-emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And the reason that's important is for 350 million years, forests took a highly dense carbon dioxide, carbon uh, packed atmosphere and drew down that carbon dioxide and deposited it into the lithospheric 
geology of the planet. And that's what we call fossil fuels and coals and things like that. And in 150 years from the Industrial Revolution, we took a lot of that carbon and we threw it back into the atmosphere because we burned to make things like, uh, uh, we, we used coal and gas and, and oil to produce cement and steel and things like that. Um, so that we were contributing heavily in, as an industrial sector to emitting carbon. What building with wood does is it stores carbon and material in a really dense way. And as long as the building is protected and detailed properly, that carbon will last in the building for a really long time. We know there are 900 thousand year old timber buildings around the world that have been protected and maintained and they've stored the carbon that came out of the forest for that long and we can start to do that again. If we don't do that, we just re-emit. And so that piece is a really, that will start to become a really important part of carbon pricing and policy. And we're actually working on policies that monetize the carbon that's stored in buildings. So basically a building developer who builds with mass timber could potentially sell carbon credits to polluters. And so that might be in some day an advantage for a town, you know, that's or a developer who's looking to develop these things. So this is really um, pretty basic biology and it's now being studied at a global scale, which is really interesting. And so uh, it's gonna change the way we build for the next 2.5 billion people who will occupy cities in the next 30 years. Um, but basic, basic, sorry, basic um, home construction, which is you know, largely wood, right? You're, yeah. not, you're not using steel yeah. and concrete to build. That doesn't accomplish that because of the way it's constructed. In other words, it's not just the use of wood, it's That's also- an excellent question. It doesn't do it, not because of the way it's constructed, but because of the way buildings form in the landscape. So if when we build our single family houses in the, out in the landscape, they do store carbon, but they're offset by all the transport infrastructure, all the electric grids, all the infrastructure that we have to build and all the car travel that takes us to get there. So if we can actually combine building density in our ur little urban areas uh, and with material density using bio-based materials, we start seeing huge advantages and it's kind of like a multiplier effect. So yes, building with wood is good. I was a carpenter before I went to architecture school and I love it. Um, but building with wood in denser configurations creates this incredible carbon storage system that, that Don mentioned. One other thing just to mention, I think it's interesting for people moving. Just, it's, it's a bit it's, of a detail. It's not us, it's because people at home can't hear you. No, no, it's fine, it's fine. But I just, it's a very small thing, but I think it's something that if we progress, and I hope we will progress, uh, when you do mass timber, it's a, it's a little bit more like Lego. So actually the amount of time you have to spend on site constructing is reduced, and the amount of noise, and the amount of trucks, and the amount of really apparatus that are brought to bear, it's a much more efficient way to build on site. Uh, you have to get everything straight ahead of time, otherwise your Legos don't join up correctly. But if you if you engineer it correctly, it's actually uh, even a lower impact. Just you know, we all know what it's like to go by construction sites. I think we've all been by Pleasantville recently and seen what was going up there. And the, and sort of some of uh, it, it can be noisy and it can be a lot of um, hubbub, really. And it's interesting to me that in a town as small and compact as we are, that this could be a, just a nice additional factor to to be aware of. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to open it up to the town board and also um, anyone, Sabrina, any uh, you know town employees. We're not going to open this up. This is not a public hearing tonight. This is really just a presentation um, by uh, the owner and developer of this property. And I'm sure there will be more to come. We will certainly be having public hearings on this. Um, but I'd like to open it up to anyone either on the town board or, or Sabrina, if, if you have any questions, comments, thoughts. I, I, have, I have some comments. And first of all, I, I support, and I supported it before. I thought when uh, you initially came to us last year with this project, uh, although it's slightly amended, I thought it was terrific, but we were in the midst of zoning, uh, and we're still now considering zoning as well, rezoning. Um, so I, I completely support in terms of the concept and who wouldn't support green. It's kind of a, a hat trick if you get affordability in green and some more units that people can live in that's access to the town. Um, but there's some issues that, that are important that we need to address and what I would encourage you to do 
when there are, there's countless people who commented on what was our FGIS on the form based code and major concerns and the three of them that would stand out the most is parking, building height, um, and, now we're, and affordability it was another big issue. Um, I encourage you to do that. I, unfortunately, when I went to our website, we're going to have to rejigger it, for lack of a better term, because it wasn't there anymore. I, I don't know who moved it or why, but it was no longer on the website in terms of its access. It was what's called Chapco Forward. It's kind of gone. You have to search, and it's very hard to search and find. In fact, I think you should ask um, someone in town to provide you that link if it can't be reestablished. But it's, it has very valuable information. Um, well, so the form-based code is no longer... Nonetheless, so there's nothing with the form based code that has to do with the questions and issues that were raised during that process about what the town wanted to see, what the concerns were. So, you know, when this initially came, um, you were looking for, uh, if I'm not, if I'm correct, 42 units. There were four affordable, um, 24 two bedroom, 18 one bedroom, uh, 42 parking spaces for residential. Uh, it was, I think, one to one in terms of the, the parking. Um, and 5,300 square feet of retail with the maximum proposed height of 50 feet, but there was no parking allotted for the retail. Now it's 45 units. The makeup is a little different. Three studios, 21 one bedrooms, 21 two bedrooms, and that 12% affordability I think is terrific. Uh, Rory Morton was on the town board back at the time, uh, wanted to make sure that the 10% would work. Uh, but what it's missing, which is I'd ask you to consider, is a workforce element because that was also something very important to the town. And again, you'll find that in the prior comments, irrespective of that zoning process, just what people were looking for and issues that people had. Um, there's 6,600 retail space now. Um, and the, the height goes from 50 feet with a maximum of 55. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll joke sort of, I don't know if anyone ever saw it, and know who Pennywise is, but there was you know, balloons in town of people with what 50 feet was, and you would expect to see them hiding around that balloon or, or something crazy coming. So there will be pushback on that height, make no mistake about it. Not on the green aspect. I think everyone would support that. I don't imagine anyone could not, but that's going to be a big issue, and, and no one wants to set you up for failure. Um, looking at parking, I, I'd ask you to consider a few things. During our comp comprehensive plan process, um, there was a big... Uh, piece of that that was no net loss of parking. That was a big concern uh, that people didn't want to see parking go away. And that parking lot you reference on North Greeley is often used. Um, the concern would be, and, and, and Lisa previously pointed this out, we don't want people parking in residential neighborhoods. Um, the, we want people to be able to park on that location. And previously, one of the issues that arose in terms of the opposition to the code at the time when we were considering the form-based code was um, there shouldn't be reduced parking requirements for a property owner. Um, there shouldn't be shared off-site private parking. There shouldn't be uh, use of off-street parking um, in lieu of your on-site your on on -site parking. Uh, and nor should there be fee in lieu of parking. Um, shared municipal parking wasn't ruled out. Uh, and we don't have to get into the weeds of it, but there were certain concepts that people had issues with and were very vocal about, and certain was okay. Um, the question I would have is, I think that using electric is phenomenal and shared driving is phenomenal. But people are going to ask, how are you going to enforce that? And how are you going to stop residents and visitors from coming and parking? And I may want to live there, and I may want to use that electric vehicle that I can share, but I may also have a car. And if you have a, a restaurant, where are they going to park? So, so I, these are real practical issues that we need to examine. And right now, our current code is one, I think it's one parking spot, pardon me, one, par, yeah, one unit is one parking spot plus one-third for every bedroom, one for every 150 feet of retail, uh, one for every 75 square feet, um, a re restaurant or th three seats, whichever is greater. So going below that, and I don't have to go into the form-based code was, but there was concern about, which was less, minimizing that requirement. So you really should expect that these are questions you're going to be asked from the community. Um, I mentioned building height. There is a term that's been bucolic that was thrown around. I, I think people are concerned. I know people are concerned about that height. 
I personally don't have an issue with that height, especially at that location. I think it's if there's ever a site that should have that height, it's train tracks right next to you. Why wouldn't you have a height there? But there'll be pushback. There have been many people, um, including those on the town board, who were concerned about anything in excess of, of three stories and that three stories was feasible economically. There's no reason that four stories was needed economically. So I think your point before about leaning or being backing up to the train track as to why four stories is more valuable to do and a better thing to do. It's not necessarily, it's not feasible at three stories, but it would be better benefit or use that was four because of where its location was. Um, the affordable housing, I would just add again that if there's a possibility to add workforce housing in some way, just speaking for myself, even if that meant adjusting the AFFH, AAFH in terms of um, a, pardon me, AFFH in terms of what that threshold number is to try to get some workforce in there too. I think that'd be valid because then people who might be, you know, our local police or local fire or local whomever it may be, while well, local is volunteer fire department regardless, but can have access in our community, live in our community, um, who are servicing our community. So if there's a way you can bring that in, that was an important component as well. So I, I am very supportive of the concept. But these are issues, I don't want to set you up for failure. I'm not beating you up just to beat you up. You're going to be asked these questions. And this was a big issue that led to the defeat of the form based code, uh, among other things, um, and led to the makeup of the board. And you should be prepared for that. So so please address all of that going so forward. So before you address that, you should just know that my esteemed colleague over there is is not mentioning the fact that the form based code was 72 acres for an entire hamlet. So while people had issues with the density on 72 acres, it was never specifically limited to just North Greeley and certainly not to a property. So while, of course, there are going to be questions about parking and um, everything else that I'm sure you're going to address, um, I don't, that's definitely not comparing apples to apples here. And, uh, and I know, I think he's referring to me as the only one who's still on the town board who was on there during the form-based code. And um, what I objected to, and I know what other members on the board objected to, was, was allowing four or more stories as of right as a development. What we always said um, is that if it made sense for a particular project and if it offered benefits to the community, that it's something we certainly would want to consider. And where... This site is located on North Greeley, is certainly heading toward a more residential area than it is the center of a commercial area. Um, so it would be something that I would certainly want, a, you know, want you to explore being able to do that. And we're certainly going to seek significant public input on this. Um, but I, I have spoken to a lot of people um, since you became on, came on the agenda. And, and I know that... Um, at least what I've been hearing is let's, you know, no one's saying it's yes, but nobody's saying it's a no. So it's not a no. Um, it's something that certainly should be explored. And, and I do think you are offering, you're checking a lot of boxes here. So I don't want to be um, discouraging. I think, though, that it's something we certainly will discuss with, with the community and get a lot of input. But I appreciate you trying to you know, get what you need and also to um, address concerns and, and wants of the community. So, yeah, go ahead. If I could just, I just respond to some fact. <laughs> uh, the, the building height is average 50. It rises to 55 feet. It drops below 50 feet. So it, it varies. And that allows us to get a roof pitch, which optimizes solar panel uh, 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 efficiency. Uh, and also to drain, you know, it provides really positive drainage for the roof, which is a more durable roof, um, which we know from old historical houses. Uh, so I just want to clarify that. And I also want to clarify that if you think you're beating me up with the, beating us up for that, you got to come to some of these other meetings. I, you guys are so nice. Well, no, I know. You I'm very supportive. I want you to know. No, you're I know. Supportive. But I am prepared for these questions. And yeah. I really encourage you to read the comments because there's a lot of people who say, Three stories, three stories, we three have, stories. We have, actually, and I want to address that, too. So this is the crux that we're wrestling with. And again, this is our first pass and presentation to you. Um, I know that there's going to be a lot of discussion and community participation on this. Um, but, but I do think uh, participation needs to be informed by not just we want, but by the crux that you run into. Um, if you want more parking, 
and you want to make the revenue work with three stories, and you want to create street amenities on the street, and particularly in a triangular lot, you have to move that housing up. So the three stories would work if it was just housing with front doors on the street. Um, but if to create that public amenity and also to create parking, now that now we're creating some volumetric pressure which generates that. So I just wanted to say that because I think we're trying to do everything, you know, trying to make it economically viable, trying to provide the mix of, of affordable, and thank you for this suggestion of workforce housing, that's really critical. Um, and also to provide that amenity which makes a street in a hamlet really a, a kind of community a space rather than just a, a quarter. So we actually, prior to coming in, we we went through the comments um, and some of the things that you'll notice. We, we're looking at the parking across the street to make two-story parking with a landscape roof deck because there's a shortage of parking because we're adding more retail in to try to accommodate a tiner. We're widening the sidewalk to create more outdoor space. Those are things that don't need to necessarily be done in development, but we're doing those things to create a better environment. Um, everything's a little bit of a give and take. Um, if we went with all of those comments and made a three-story building and made the same parking that's right Rite Aid now, I can tell you now, we wouldn't be in this room because those are things that couldn't be done. I develop all over the place. If I went with all of those things, we wouldn't be building a building because it's not a building to be built. Those are ways not to build a building. There's many ways to build buildings. There's many ways not to build a building. Those comments are ways not to build a building because it's not something that can be accomplished. If you have three stories, your first story is lost to parking, retail, and then you'd have two floors of apartments. You're on train tracks. You have nothing in the back of the building. So by going to four stories, you're moving all of the apartments away so they can actually be habitable. You're creating retail that's actually used for the community so everybody gets it. We're setting back and having courtyards so you have open space for the community, widening the sidewalk, having really meaningful landscape trees in your outdoor area. You go to New York City, you see trees we plant on the sidewalk to accommodate the city. They're the size of this. They don't last. They never really grow. What they've designed is a meaningful landscape sidewalk area that can really be used. People will actually use it. So we're taking every one of the comments prior to coming in here and trying to address them. And again, this is the first pass. It's gonna to continue to be worked on. We're gonna take all the comments back from today, the public hearings and continue to work on it until we get something that everybody is happy with. So, and by the way, some of the height is your elevators have to go past the top floor. So they, you have an elevator machine room. So work with us, we're gonna work with you. And hopefully at the end of the day, we're all happy and have a project that everyone would like to see come to fruition in the town. I will say it is interesting how you dealt because that lot and I and the one immediately north of yours is interesting because you it is Strong. on the train tracks yeah. um, and they are odd configurations. So it is interesting. I appreciate how you dealt with that where you're putting kind of community space against the train tracks because we do have another development in town on the train tracks where windows are not allowed to open. Um, to apartments because of the proximity of the train tracks. So I, I do appreciate how you how you dealt with that. And that's what those courtyards are. Those basically become your light and air. That's so us trying to figure out, can that apartment see into the next apartment? Is that person's terrace too far from the next terrace? I was playing a little Tetris for a few weeks. So thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts from the town board? I, I, I was just curious. You mentioned, you know, how original, unique sui generis, whatever word you want to use, this project would be. But are there other locations where you've done something like this in a smaller community? Um, in, uh, there are developments underway in, in uh, sort of exurban areas around the country. Uh, the Pacific Northwest was a leader, and there are several really beautiful examples of those. Um, there are uh, examples in bigger cities like Portland in the outskirts where they're building four or five, six story buildings like this. Um, so there, there's a, there are a bunch of examples of that. Uh, what we're seeing is a lot of um, what are called light frame construction going up to try to meet these housing demands, which are just, poor, frankly, just poorer quality buildings. Um, and they, they are built on site, so that it takes a lot longer to build them. I think uh, 
Don mentioned the prefabrication aspect of these engineered heavy wood systems. Uh, they reduce, you know, noise of construction, it's smaller crews, lighter material handling equipment, on time deliveries, all these kinds of things that have been seen as benefits by other municipalities. Um, we've worked on several of these projects in, in different places. This would be one of the first. We're doing one in uh, outskirt of New Haven, which is actually about the same scale. I know it's New Haven, Connecticut, and it's a city, but it's it, it's a, in an outskirt, which is largely, I would say, two, two three-story house, single-family house or multi-family houses, uh, more conventional worker, sub-worker, uh, uh, districts um, and we are using these techniques there and it's actually serving a need and it's proven to be really advantageous financially for all these sort of external reasons so um, I'm happy to share uh, examples globally of this if you'd like yeah, that we can do it. yeah. Um, it's a pretty great spaces to be in yeah, I, I just wanted to comment um, and congratulate you on what is really a very creative and inspirational design. Um, I work professionally with smart and connected communities around the country that are looking at timber builds, and so I know this is really leading edge, and, uh, and it's an exciting opportunity for the town of Newcastle to be a part of you know, creating what could be a model for suburban development. Um, and I love how you've thought through every aspect of you know, environmental, um, economic, and social sustainability in your design. So we'll, we'll obviously be engaging the public, but I think it's really impressive uh, for the first look at it. Thank you. Right. Uh, Sabrina, any thoughts, comments? No? Not, Not at this time. Okay. So um, um, I would just like to yeah. start with an addition to the question. Sure. I, I just want to thank you for bringing such an innovative uh, design to our attention. Uh, the thoughtfulness and the consideration not just to the design but also to the community building aspect uh, because that's really what we want we want a community that wants to come into our downtown hamlet and stay there and you know build relationships and connections as well as you know creating housing um, i think the environmental aspect and the green building innovation is very exciting i think it's something that will be well, well received in our community. Um, as for myself, in terms of the building height, I would say that um, my prior concerns with the previous proposal that came before the board before I was on it was, was far different from what you're presenting here. It was about four stories, not only as of right, but four stories throughout the 72 acres. So there's absolutely no comparison, and it was that without any requirement for any amenities or um, any improvement to our town other than what a developer wanted to build. So as you look at those questions, and it's fair to say you should look at what concerns were, but it's really, you know, not apples to apples. And so my concerns are, are not, you know, uh, of, of the same quality and seriousness as what, what was expressed, you know, in the pro you know, previous um, projects. Um, I know that there's a lot to say, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I really look forward to um, continuing the conversation with you and with the residents of the town. So thank you so much. All right, so um, I guess, Sabrina or Ed, what would, uh, you know, I think the town board has said enough that it's something that's certainly interesting enough that we want to, you know, allow this to go forward, not, not, don't shoot me, not in the, not in this necessarily iteration, but I mean move forward to the next steps to uh, solicit public input. And so what would be those next steps and how would that progress? I think most um, immediately some continued meetings with town staff to flesh out some of the issues that have been raised tonight that are more technical in nature, like parking. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps the applicant would come back at that point with uh, some additional ins information or refinements in the proposal. Ultimately, we're working toward a zoning change petition because we know that we're going to have to deal with that a minimum building height. And at that point, it's somewhat up to the applicant as to whether uh, it wants to also come in at or around the same time with a site plan application. Um, but that's something that could be fleshed out at the, at the staff level in these meetings that I'm anticipating. So we would sort of look at this first, solicit public input really on, on the concept and a potential zoning change, whether it be large scale or 
whatever it may be. Um, and then we refer it to the planning board, or they just come in. That's a separate application as part of the site plan approval. No, the, the zone change petition uh, is 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 the town board, and that's mm -hmm. a familiar one. That's a that's a, requires a local law with the, the mandatory referrals to the Newcastle Planning Board, the Westchester County Planning Board, mm -hmm. and a public hearing. Site plan approval is planning board, mm -hmm. so that could either run alongside of the the. Uh, the zoning petition, uh, or the zoning petition could be dealt with in first. And once that's done, the applicant could turn to the planning board for site plan approval. So it's really the applicant's prerogative. Do we have to do an environmental impact study, or can we? There will be, obviously, a, a determination of environmental significance that will have to be made. There will have to be a lead agency established. I imagine that will be the town board, but that's a little bit stream and then I would like to propose you know at least one separate meeting solely based on with the public based on this application that's before us not in addition to um, a, the, the required public meeting with the zoning change but really just a, I don't want to call it a brainstorming meeting but a initial impact meeting where people are really can give thoughts and ideas as to this um, current proposal to see if there are any other ideas that may come up that could could uh, you know make changes that for the better in, in the proposal so I, I would definitely advocate for one of one, a separate meeting not necessarily in connection with the zoning change but just in connection with with just the proposal in general how, how do you do that do you have it here in this room or we would have it either in this room or if we're expecting a lot of people in a, a room. Be a representation. Has, has, the, yeah. has the applicant done any outreach to the community as part of this discovery of, of putting together their presentation? Do they have any plans for that? Well, to my, this went to the public. Unbeknownst to me, this went to the public when we submitted last Thursday. I so, think that it's bigger. It's bigger question than going to the public. No, but the first I'm, I'm just saying, well, it like we were general. we were coming to workshop, but it did go to the public, right? I, I can say no, this because no, I got I'm talking about public outreach, like, like conversations with the neighbors. Well, that's what I was really talking about. I, I don't. I don't know that you've done it before, but that was what I was talking about, is having a, a public meeting, you know, based on this proposal, where again you can sort of introduce it to the public. Maybe you have big um, boards. That people can look at and and really get just the thoughts and the initial perceptions of this from the public that, and uh, that's and really a normal part of our design process because mm -hmm. we really care a lot about participation because you know if the if the people who really own the building which is the community doesn't have a, any chance to comment on it I think that's just like top-down control and no one wants to be part of that mm -hmm. to answer the specific question do we reach out what we did really was read the comments that you referred to, tried to understand all of the competing interests and goals for the site, some of which are competing so much that they cancel each other out. And we really, this was a feasibility study to see, can we do these things? Can we come up with an architectural solution that tries to deliver as much as an, of an answer to these concerns, bring that to your attention, to have you tell us, you know, yes, we'd like to bring it to the public rather than crowdsource ideas, we feel like you'd already done that for us, honestly. So we had really good information that were the criteria by which we could develop this building and check its feasibility. It's feasible. So now is the time to go and say, this is a, our best use of the site. What are your thoughts about it? And, and I, I find, having led a lot of community participation uh, projects, um, the best way to do that is to hear the basic Take the temperature of the town, then come up with a feasible solution for people to respond to. Do you give it your best shot, and then have people come in on it. If you just ask people for what they want, the wish list, what you get is we need more parking, we need retail, we need uh, a low building, um, we need it to look exactly like it does right now, mine it but better. And, and that's, not our, that's not a meaningful response that we can work with. So what we're trying to do is put something forward and from that generate a really rich discussion that's meaningful and informed. And so I would say that's how I see as a really productive method of getting a good building made for a town like this. 
We can facilitate that. Yeah, we can facilitate that. Yeah, so that. we came here tonight. We met with the town board. Mm -hmm. We're going to take back the comments. We're going to work on it a little bit further. Um, the answer to the question, yes, we met with some of the neighbors. Actually, some of them before tonight. Um, right before tonight, one of them. Um, and we're going to work on it a little bit further, and then I think we'll be ready to present again. Um, we can preview it again here if you'd like before going and having a public meeting, if that's what's preferred, before the next steps. That'd be great. Great. That sounds perfect. perfect. We're, we're happy to follow the lead of the town board. Okay. Thank you. Sounds good. You. Uh, anything else? All right. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you're out of the hot seat for now. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. Thank you for having and us. We will, uh, we will all be in touch with next steps. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank good you night. so Thank much. You. Good to finally meet you. Now. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that was exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, any applicant can use the FGIS in the park, the pool, and explain how that would work. What the prior FGIS from the prior zoning? Uh, zoning process. I mean, do you mean the studies that right, went the studies, behind right. it? Correct. Sure, that, that's all public information. It's all, I understand um, it, it's not on that uh, landing page, but uh, it's all public record. So they can, well, how does that work? They would say, you've already studied X, you found X, because some of us would think it's flawed, so I would assume it wouldn't work. So how, did that, how does it, whether you cho choose it or not, well, don't present, forget that was stunning does, 72 does it, acres. Does it, does, it, does it get presented to us and we say we agree and we've already done it? You know, it's a little hard to discuss it in the abstract, and especially at, at this stage. Because it certainly of, saves time. Uh, it, it could, but, you know, it, it would depend on what issue we're talking about and, and what, it, what was being brought forward and what, was it, what it was being used for. You know, so generally, generically, sure, but we need to be more specific. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, great. Lisa, I'd ask that you put it back up so that people can access it. I think it's important. There's a lot of comments and questions, especially if the applicant could potentially use it or rely on it or access it. It's important that everyone can see it because it's relevant potentially. Going I mean, it's available. Anyone can FOIL it or have access to it. It's just that it was taking up a lot of space on our website for a project that is now dead. So um, that's why uh, Sabrina also, everyone thought it should be taken down, but it is still, there are still public comments that are more than available for anybody to, uh, to access. It was hard for me as, to find. As they did. It was hard for me to find in terms of searching. Um, so ultimately, if that's how people have to FOIL it or figure out how to search it, then that's your decision. But I think that it's important that it's easily accessible. I, I think yeah, that's I, fairly typical yeah, um, when a project has been addressed. I, I would just I would just add that you know if this project goes forward, it's going forward completely outside the context of the form based code. Certainly. So mm -hmm. so so all the comments that came in during the form based code process, to the extent anyone has those specific issues, objections, concerns, they will air them here. We we certainly know what many of them might be. But the idea that we need to go back and revisit, as you clearly did before tonight. Many of those, to me, is sort of a, an apples to oranges issue. But access to information, that's all. But yeah, I mean, right. there's, a, there's a lot of, we can have access to the Chappaqua Crossing DGIS. We can still have that on the website, too. I don't think we do. No, we don't. Right. So, um, <laughs> definitely not. Um, but there is. The information is public. It, it is available. This, to me, is, is one proposal that's being brought in on one site, not a 72-acre uh, you know, environmental impact study, which obviously is going to have significant impacts beyond what one development would have, uh, or one proposed parcel. So, um, all right, well, I thought this was, this was quite interesting. Again, uh, just for the public, you know, anyone who owns a property is certainly allowed to bring something before the board. We really look at it, see if it's something that we would even consider moving forward, not that we necessarily agree with everything in there, just if it's something, you know, if they came up and said they wanted to put in something that we knew the town was never going to have any taste for, like, let's say know a strip club we might just say no that's you know go back to to you don't need to quote that please <laughs> you know go back and that's not something we're even going to consider but this is something obviously it's housing it's retail it's something that that could work in our town so it's something we're gonna 
move forward, obviously subject to significant uh, public comment and input, as well as input from our planning board and our various advisory boards and, and town staff as well. All right, so next on our agenda then is uh, an update by the Northern Westchester Wireless Master Plan by Cityscape. I see you on there, Susan. Yes, good evening. How is everyone? Good. How are you? Are you going to tell us that we have a presentation? I enjoyed it myself. It was very interesting to me as well. It's one of the things that I do enjoy about going to all these different hearings around the country is I get to see what people are doing, and it's always very exciting. But anyway, I do have some updates for you. I'm going to share my screen. Susan, before you yes. do that, can um so just to give a little flavor to it. So this is an, an update again, you know, you are conducting the studies for the Northern Westchester Wireless Master Plan that looks at, um, I guess, not only infrastructure, but capacity and, um, and the quality of our wireless, which I can tell you without a study is not so great. Um, so, and then you'll be giving us recommendations going forward, is that correct? And, and introducing a survey as well. Yeah, um, not necessarily recommendations. I'm going to present to you information that will lead to the poll so that you all can uh, help guide recommendations on how to proceed going forward to fill in your gaps that I'm going to show you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes. I have a a little bit of a recap from last time that we met. Just a moment to get things set up on my end. There we go. So as we just described, this is a project being done throughout the region of the northern Westchester County area. We are looking at the wireless telecommunications infrastructure that make your handsets work. This is not about wireless broadband or wired broadband. It is just wireless telecommunications. The last time we met, which was just a couple of weeks ago, I went through the preliminary research. The, we had our project initiation meeting. I have since completed the assessments of your existing sites and we have completed your inventory catalog. Tonight, we're going to look at the mapping, the engineering mapping from the sites that we've assessed. The, again, just to provide you a, a brief visual, this is the infrastructure that has started with first generation wireless back in the 1980s and has progressed to your four and 5G enabled wireless cell phones. And as the evolution of wireless continues, you'll in the future be hearing more about 5G and 6G and 7G and onward as the industry continues to develop into the next decade. Some quick facts that I'd like to share with you. We talked a little bit about this last time is that there's an estimate that over 49% of U.S. households have cut the cord and they're using just wireless only. There's an 80% of estimated 240 million 911 calls are being made from wireless devices. You have 45 million Americans using their mobile phones as their primary internet access. The devices now are being used for connectivity for students, working remote, smart houses, smart cars. There's some other estimates of 76% travelers use their mobile phones as an important trip accessory. And by the year 2023, there's an estimated 31 billion devices across the board to be connected through the wireless infrastructure that is built or being built. The way the infrastructure works is that you have to have these elevated antennas over buildings and rooftops and tree canopies. 
geographic formations such as ridgelines, mountaintops, in order for there to be a clear signal transmitted between the infrastructure. These larger, taller antenna, well, the larger antenna on these taller structures are what I refer to and the industry refers to as a macro cell. The industry is adding in certain urban areas and certain areas with larger population densities, small wireless facilities. These small wireless facilities are 50 feet or less in height. The antenna is considerably smaller. It is three cubic feet per volume. Anything larger than that automatically puts it into a macro cell facility. The idea is that in the future, your macro cells will remain the backbone to your wireless infrastructure and provide your coverage and large amounts of capacity. And then these small wireless facilities will fill in with burst of capacity so that you have an umbrella of coverage in your more densely populated areas. Newcastle has nine wireless facilities inside your zoning jurisdiction. C1 is a monopole. C2 is also a monopole. C5 is a monopole. C6 is a lattice tower. C8 is a concealed facility. It needs a little bit of work to re repair work. And C9 is a monopole. You have three base stations. A base station is a facility that the antenna mounts to that was not built for the sole purpose of hoisting that antenna. So your utility easement facilities such as C3 and C4 are considered a base station because those structures were built for the primary purpose of these transmission lines. And they do make a good location for the antenna, but that wasn't the sole purpose of the structure, so it's a base station. You also have a base station at C7, where you have an antenna mounted to the wall of the utility HVAC on the rooftop of that structure. So those are your nine sites that you have inside your jurisdiction. You don't have, with the exception of that, let me get back to this. With the exception of this mon with this unipole, that's what this structure is called, most of your facilities are either what we consider non-concealed or semi-concealed. When you have excuse me, I need a quick sip of water. <clears throat> Sorry about that. When you have a monopole that has some painting to it, like this one does or where the antenna are painted to maybe blend in more with the canopy. We consider that semi-concealed. You can still see that antenna, but it might not stick out as much as if it were not painted. You have one facility that we consider concealed, and that's your C8 site. Other examples of concealed macro facilities in the study area are found on these images. This one is S7, that's in Somers, and it's a painted unipole, similar to the one that you have, but this one is painted green to blend in more with the trees. This is a concealed mono pine, where the antenna at the top sort of blend in with this fake foliage. This is a concealed base station in Yorktown. This steeple is built solely for the purpose of having a wireless facility behind these louvers. Examples of small wireless facilities are found also in Somers. This is a small wireless facility on a utility pole, same in this one for S5. Note though that these are not used for personal wireless services. 
but they do still meet the category of a small wireless facility. These are being used by the utility company in their smart metering program. Other examples of what a small wireless facility would look like in a concealed fashion is not in the study area because it doesn't exist, but I wanted to provide you an image. On this facility, you can see that the antenna are not as visible as they are on these two images because they're shrouded with this dome that goes around the antenna and the cables are either flush mounted in conduit or going up the interior of the pole so you don't see them. So let's look at the mapping of the overall study area first. There's 104 wireless facilities in the Northern Westchester County area that we've assessed and that we have mapped. Those are shown by the black dots on these on this map. If you have a dot that has an open circle, that's a base station. The towers are the black dots. So you can just do a quick visual and you can see that most of the infrastructure are towers versus base stations. Focusing just on Newcastle, as I mentioned, you have nine within the zoning jurisdiction of your community, but you have 22 wireless structures that actually service your geographic area. Inside of your boundary, you have six existing towers, and then you have eight existing in the perimeter. That's what this dash line is around the perimeter. That's a one mile buffer that we include because we know that these sites have an impact within your zoning jurisdiction. If we left them out, it would not give us a complete image of your propagation model. You have three base stations in, inside your community. You have three base stations in the perimeter and one that's proposed and under review. So again, most of these structures are towers and not base stations. For the inventory for personal wireless service facilities of the 22 sites, 21 of those towers and base stations are used for personal wireless service facilities. You have only one facility that is located just outside of your zoning jurisdiction over Mount Kisco that is used just for public safety. Other than that, you have 21 facilities that have personal wireless service antenna on them. With regards to where they're located, the majority of, your prop of the sites are on private property. There are 13 of the 22 sites on private property. One is in the right of way, and it's this 09 site is actually in the one mile buffer, but it is in the right of way. You have four on public property, one of which is in Newcastle, three within your one mile buffer, and one in the one mile buffer that's proposed and under review. And you have four in the utility easement, two of which are in Newcastle and two of which are in Yorktown within the one mile buffer. And again, just to recap, the design type, the majority are non-concealed, 16 are non-concealed, you have two that are concealed and four that we consider semi-concealed. So what we're going to do now is look at simulated propagation coverage maps from those sites that I just pointed out. It's very important for me to make sure that you all understand that these are simulated coverage and capacity maps to identify gaps in your service area. We don't know the exact antenna being used. We don't know the power densities being used. We don't know, we don't have information about the beam tilt or remote radio units that are helping to boost power on these particular sites. So what we use is a common antenna configuration. We take into consideration the terrain, the tree cover, clutter for your area, in terms of building types and the amount of vegetation and the type of vegetation, your weather, climate. And we use those variables to show you the gaps. And we're not trying to pinpoint specifically where the great coverage is 
really wanting to focus on where the coverage is not, because that's where we know the industry will need to go in the future, and you can plan proactively for those areas. So we assume that the same provider is at each facility. We know that each provider is not at every single facility, but we assume that if there's a tower there or a base station, then more service providers could go at that location. And if they did, what would it look like if all the service providers were there? We also use the high frequency coverage map because that is the propagation pattern that the industry gravitates towards the most and the one that they use in their planning process. And we show the level of coverage in a gradation of colors from yellow to blue to no color. So the colors that you see in yellow represent a very strong signal that means that the, the pattern operates or the, the propagation from that infrastructure can get into the buildings that are in that area and certainly cover the outside area. Green areas represent an average propagation pattern where the coverage might get into the building, but it's primarily going to be an outdoor and in-vehicle service. Where you see blue, that coverage area, like these blue shades in here, those are primarily outdoor coverage areas. You might get some indoors, but primarily outdoors. And then where there is no coloration at all, those areas represent no, there's, there's no coverage at all. That, that's your biggest gap. And so when we look at Newcastle, these are the sites in your study area, the 21 sites that we talked about in the previous maps, and when we turn them on, this is the propagation pattern that we get. And where you have sites close together, that is a, that's a, that's showing how the sites link um, from one to the other. And as you can tell, you've got areas throughout your community where there is spotty or no coverage at all. You're getting a lot of benefit from these clusters of sites in Yorktown and from some of these sites in Mount Kisco, and then some of the properties here in the perimeter are helping to tie back into the infrastructure in your community. So I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about each of these areas. Um, I'm going to just scroll through and just get them all highlighted. It's easier. Oops, sorry. So your site C1 is an interesting site because normally when we would see a, a tower up in an area like this, we would expect to have a wider propagation pattern. But you've got a situation up in this geographic area of the community where this tower is actually built lower than the top ridge lines or the top peaks of these hills. In fact, the tower right here is below the peak of that hill, which is right here, by at least 10 feet. And then you have other hills around that geographic area such that the pattern can only go so far because it's blocked by the topography. That means because there's higher elevations here between C1 and M2, the signal cannot get between these two sites, and so you have this void. You have a ridge line that runs due west of the Sawmill Parkway. So you have a situation where the propagation pattern from, from M1 to C7 C7 and C8 can propagate better to the east than it can to the west because this ridge line is higher than what these antenna can get over. 
That's, That's what's causing this gap area between your C7 and C8 in your cluster of sites over here at C3, C4, and C5. You have a situation where C2 is putting out a nice propagation pattern, but the distance from C2 to this site, O21, is too far. And given the, the variable terrain, it's not as tall as what you have over here, but it's tall enough and the distance is too wide, and that's what's creating this gap. There's nothing in the perimeter or here in the most western part of your town where these sites can hand off to. You're going to need something in this area, and you're going to need sites in these areas to be able to have undisturbed handoff between these facilities. Similarly, you have the, the situation between C8 and C9, where you've got a tempo problem, and again, from C9 to O9, C9 to M7, you have a decent um, range of topography, but then you run into your peaks again, your ridgeline again, and you get blockage. So the terrain in your area is really a hardship for the deployment of the infrastructure and causing the problem of your lost calls and lack of, of coverage and capacity. Now this map is primarily looking at your coverage. Capacity is a very difficult um, variable to map. But what we do is we look at your land use classifications. We got this information from the tax assessor's office. And we, mark, we map out the parcels based on land use. We can tell by looking at this, this um, sort of brown color represents residential. And a large, a large part of your community is residential. In fact, you have over 5,000 parcels that are identified with the residential land use. You have 109 parcels with commercial. They're recognized by this sort of reddish color. And it's no coincidence that you have infrastructure in these red areas because they are situated along the thoroughfares and they're situated in areas that are close to residential and your zoning probably promotes them in those districts and the industry wants to go in those areas because it provides infrastructure and service to uh, those high or intensive land use zoning districts. So you've got a few areas identified in red and you have infrastructure in those exact areas. <clears throat> you have 400 540 parcels of vacant land, and again, that adds to the rural character of your community. So you have a large residential community with a pretty good amount of vacant land, parkland, open-use recreational land, which adds to this rural characteristic. That's important to us because that tells us that the industry is probably not going to come here with the use of a lot of small wireless facilities, except perhaps in some of your more densely populated areas and in some of these commercial zones to boost power. You have your Sawmill Parkway and the Taconic State Parkway Corridor, and we know the industry wants to cover that area for um, mobilization. And as we saw on the previous slide, you had some pretty good coverage here along the sawmill, and you've got pretty good coverage here along the Taconic. So that, that, those areas look pretty good. The next variable that we add to the land use is to look at your demographics provided by the U.S. Census Bureau. We look at your people per square mile, and we try and gauge how many people per square mile are relying on the infrastructure and putting stress on that infrastructure from a capacity perspective. Because what happens is, while this map here on the right, which I just showed you, 
is, is filled with lots of yellow in these certain areas. areas. That's, That's great for coverage, but as you add, say around here, around this site for C8, where you have over 3,000 people per square mile, and in this shading where you have between two and 3,000 people per square mile, those, those densities cause this coverage area to shrink. And when it shrinks, these yellow areas get very small. And so we've taken the information from the census data in combination with your uh, land use and your propagation pattern for coverage, and we've come up with a capacity map. And this simulates areas where we think you're going to need the most emphasis of infrastructure over the next 10 years. And the areas where there is no coloration, those are your biggest, largest gaps from not having any infrastructure there at all. The green areas show us that the number of people per square mile and the land uses per square mile, the ratio of that is pretty good. And we don't necessarily see a lot more infrastructure needed in this area. The orange, however, shows us areas that you definitely have a problem with capacity because of the number of people per square mile using that infrastructure, like at C8 and O19. You don't have any red. Red is a very poor capacity area, but because your demographics are not higher than around the three and 4,000 uh, people per square mile, especially just in this area, it doesn't play too much on the capacity. Your main issues are not having any coverage in certain areas and then going forward in the future, you'll need to have additional sites, even in this area here, around C8, to cover capacity. Now again, we look at and assume that each service provider is on all of this, all of these sites. It could be in the future that you don't have enough capacity at these towers for these locations for each service provider to be on that site. And so you may end up getting another facility in here to accommodate a service provider who might not be able to go on one of these towers because it might not be structurally sound enough to accommodate their equipment. So before I move into the next set of slides or the next point of discussion, do you have any questions on anything that I've presented or talked about so far? No. No? no. Okay. okay. Well, well, then the next thing that I want to talk about is our community poll. And I'm going to stop sharing this screen, and I'm going to go to another one. Because what we want to do now is introduce to you the wireless infrastructure poll that we would like for you to respond to and to share with the community for them to look at these gaps and provide feedback on the type of infrastructure that they would like to see in those areas where we show you are going to need sites. So this is a poll that has been used in the other communities so far. And the first few questions are about the person who is taking the poll. We want to know if they're answering the poll on behalf of themselves or on behalf of their household. We want them to answer a few questions about whether or not they live in the town year-round. Do they live in the town and work outside of the town? Do they live in the town and work in the town? We want to know how they use their phone. Do they use it for employment purposes? Is it for medical devices? Is it for enjoyment? And then they have the opportunity to identify the area that they live in and the area that they work in. And then we ask them who their service provider is. 
We also want to give them the opportunity to tell us how many wireless devices they're using in their household. And that would be wireless phones, laptops that are using the subscription for the wireless phone, tablet watches. We're not talking about home computer systems that are used by an internet service provider. The reason we want to know this is or get an idea of the number of households is because that weighs in on the capacity of the area. It used to be that people still had their landlines and their landlines were connected by copper and they went into Mabel or whoever it is that was your local exchange provider. And then one person, maybe two people, had a wireless phone. Now you have households like ours where our children are of age where they all have one and we have one. And when we have um, everyone home, we have eight wireless devices that people are texting with and checking scores and sending pictures and checking the weather and working, checking email. And all of that plays on the capacity of that geographic region. So that's why we want to know how many devices are used in the household. We also want to know are people relying on boosters to help enhance their wireless support wireless service. Then we ask some qualifying questions. We want people to share with us where they reside. Do they have excellent coverage, meaning five bars indoors, or is it, is it acceptable with three bars? Is their service poor with one bar? Is it inconsistent or is it not applicable? Maybe they don't have a, a, a wireless phone. And then we ask the same questions for where they work and when they travel around the town. Now we want to know how important is their wireless service to them. We ask, would they rely more on their mobile device if their service was better? Is the quality of service important to them? And are there any specific areas of town where their service is particularly poor? And we want to take that information and compare it to our maps and see how our simulated maps are measuring compared to the feedback that people give us. We can tweak our maps if we need to based on this type of feedback. Now, the next section of the survey gets more into the type of infrastructure that they see and we want to know what they like and what they don't like. So we ask them this question, what is more important to you? Excellent connectivity, aesthetics, or both? Good connectivity and minimal impact with visual? Or you know, are people willing to tolerate for service for less infrastructure? We want to know if people are interested in allowing a taller facility that would have more collocations on them, or do they prefer to keep a shorter facility with the knowledge that fewer tenants could go on that vertical real estate and that you may have to have more infrastructure in that same geographic area because the tower is not as tall to accommodate all of the service providers in one location. Then we give images of what the non-concealed infrastructure looks like. We have a picture of a monopole, a lattice, a guide tower, and we want people to tell us which one that they prefer. And then we do the same with concealed types of towers. We have the monopine, a bell tower, the unipole, faux silos, flagpoles, faux water towers. And then we do similar with the base stations. We have images of non-concealed base stations, followed by images of semi-concealed and concealed base stations, and then the same for small wireless facilities. This helps us gauge the type of infrastructure that the community likes, what they don't like. We will then take this information and compare it to your land use code to see if you need to tweak it in a way that promotes one type of infrastructure over another. And it also helps you going forward 
and as new sites come in, to rely on this type of information to tell the service providers, well, this is what we want based on the response from our community. We want to then give just a little bit of information about where the community would support infrastructure going, future infrastructure. Do they support using town-owned property? Do they support using um, having facilities somewhere other than their neighborhood? Would they support having a facility in or near their neighborhood? And then they also have the option to indicate that they don't want properties that are publicly owned used for the infrastructure. There's a lot of benefits to using public property. Of course, you have the revenue that is generated from the lease of that property, but also, and, and for some communities, even more important than the revenue, is the ability for the local community to control what the facility looks like and to control the maintenance of that facility. And because, well, I should say, because the public is the landowner, so you control how that looks, how it's maintained, and if you have a problem, you can go directly to the source more quickly than if it's on private property. We do require that a email address be provided. This email will not be used for anything other than this poll. It is one, it's just a way for us to validate that the, uh, it's, a, it's a valid poll response. They do have an option to leave an address if they want. And then we have a spot for comments and suggestions. And I do ask that people respect the fact that we only want one response per person. Some people might have multiple emails. But we ask people to refrain from using all their email addresses to answer the poll and instead pick the one email that you like the most and use that one to register. And are there any questions with regard to the poll? So, uh, Susan, do you have, not with specifically with the poll, but do you have introductory language that you've been using that you found effective uh, to introduce the poll, to incentivize people to take the poll? Um, we have not, we have been relying on the communities to do that. I've shared with you a, uh, a public announcement that Pound Ridge used, and I think a number of the communities have put the presentation on the same landing page as the link to the poll, so people can look at the presentation. They can, I think even some of them have put the recorded presentation, like the public initiation presentation that we just did a couple of weeks ago, so people can watch that, they can look at the PowerPoint, and then they can take the poll if they would like. But, um, I don't have anything that is an introductory paragraph. Okay. And then something else you can put with it, I'm gonna share my screen one more time and share with you the inventory catalog that we put together. This is just for your community of your sites. This is your inventory map by tower and base station. And the image of each of your facilities, a small inset map that gives a geographic reference to where the site is located and gives you some information about the site that we found while we were out doing the assessments. So you can also put this next to the, or, or on the landing page with all the links so that people can have visuals as they go through if they need them. That's a good idea. Um, Susan, I'm really concerned about requiring email addresses and I'm afraid that you, you might lose a lot of people that way. Um, I, I don't really know how these polls are structured and if there's any other way to do it or if there's a, a statistical margin of error that, that can be used to account for people possibly using multiple. I mean, I'm sure not everybody would do that. Well, I just, the, the platform that we use for the survey is 
based on email. And we're not going to use it, use their email for any other purpose. We're going to publish their email when we publish the survey. And I have no doubt of that. It's, it's just we don't it have a right. no. mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have, we don't have another way to do it without the email. Do you have a tighter map by chance that zooms in a little bit better so that people can have a, a clear understanding of where they are within those zones of service? Because I don't believe, at least what you showed, there was any streets on those maps. And I think that would be helpful because I know, for example, my service is deplorable to the point that it's hard for me to work at home. Um, but I can go a little bit of a distance and it's a little bit better. Some places we just lose it in its entirety. Um, and it could be a matter of it's a term feet, really not literally a foot or two, but it could be uh, you know, a two minute walk, one minute walk, and you're in a better place. So if there's something that you can provide that's more detailed, that would be very helpful to the community. I'll see what we can do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and how long is the survey open? That is up to you. We recommend a couple of weeks. But with July 4th, around the corner, you might want to do three weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it is live, and I have sent the link out. Um, I think Sabrina and Jill have it. And so uh, you can start right away responding to the survey. We'll work on a little bit of an introductory yeah. intro language, yeah. Oh, sure. I understand. Yeah, but, but we, the, the target would be to try to get it up this week because we would like to be able to um, catch people before, before they leave town. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Sure. So then our next step is after the survey has been closed, we need about two weeks to call the data. Compare that to your zoning ordinance, or compare the responses and the maps to the zoning ordinance. And then I'll come back and present that to you, and then we'll move forward with the draft of the master plan. Great. All right. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And I look forward to working with you on this in the future, and I will look into the map tomorrow and see if I can get you something with better streets. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good evening. You too. Bye. 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 Take care. Okay. So next, uh, we are going to talk about workers' compensation coverage. I know. It, it's, it is. Everyone's been on the edge of their seat. I know. <laughs> Rob is here. He's done a Herculean task of going through this stuff with assistance from RJ. Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to RJ in a minute. I see him online. Just want to talk a little bit about um, our coverage over the years. And we started, um, RJ joined us in about 2014 after we had a, a quote that was close to a million dollars. Um, RJ brought us over to uh, New York State Insurance Fund and they quoted us uh, somewhere in the area of 500000 or so. We saved over 400,000 that year, close to 500,000 by switching carriers. Um, at the time we were with PERMA, and through no fault of theirs, we had some pretty terrible claims history. We had several really long-term, very serious injuries that were on the books. And as a result of that, like any insurance company, our rating was terrible, so our premiums kept going up. Um, new York State Insurance came in, and because we were a new entity to them, they were able to quote us without for the first two years without factoring that in. Um, and then from that point on, used our experience with them um, going forward. So um, with the help of RJ and Nicole from Poe and Son, um, and Jill and, and uh, Bart, Jerry Marshall, the chief, um, we had a pretty aggressive training program. And um, basically, we worked pretty hard to get all these people um, kind of those that were injured, we kind of got them off or back to work, and uh, the training kind of um, reduced the incidences of injury and definitely serious injuries. So uh, fast forward to today, 
in the last couple of years, PERMA has been, uh, RJ has got quotes from both PERMA and State Insurance Fund. State Insurance Fund over that period of time was still a little bit lower, um, so we continued with them. Um, today's quote for the policy starting on July 1, if you looked at my memo, it's very close. Um, if you net everything out based on the estimate of the dividend that State Insurance Fund pays, they were actually a little bit lower. Um, the problem that we've run into over the last couple of years is there's actually a payroll audit. And um, as fun as that sounds, they actually review each dollar um, that we paid somebody and what category that employee was and the type of work that they did. And each task is assessed a different uh, rating. Unfortunately, over the last two years, that payroll audit resulted in a significant reduction of our dividends. So the quotes that we thought we were seeing at that time and the savings or or the, um, the better pricing that we had versus PERMA didn't materialize. And you don't know that until uh, typically about six months after the, um, uh, the policy period ends. Unfortunately, due to some issues with the state insurance fund, our quote, our uh, audit from 19 and 20 didn't get finished until January of this year, um, which led to um, the last couple of quotes that we had from state insurance fund being based on incorrect payrolls and and the um, dividends being reduced for those two years. So factoring in that dividend that number one, it's not 100% um, guaranteed at that amount each year. And the fact that I know it's going to re be reduced for this policy period. Um, and PERMA was able to quote us actually a three year quote where if we maintain the level of loss ratios that we've had over the last seven or eight years, um, the quote will actually go down each year. So um, at this point, Jill and I both, I think, are comfortable recommending change back to PERMA. Um, PERMA always had very good claims coverage. We knew at the time when we switched to state insurance fund that um, um, their claims handling was a little bit kludgy, I would say. Um, they don't have dedicated account reps for each um, municipality. So we could place a claim today and it would be put with one adjuster. We could place one tomorrow, it would be with a different one. At PERMA, they have dedicated staff. So that was one of the reasons RJ and Fo and Son came in and, and helped us out because Nicole has been good at kind of walking our claims through there. Um, but I guess we get a little bit of uh, probably double coverage now with Nicole being able to work directly with, uh, with PERMA. But I think um, at this point, I'll turn it over to RJ. Maybe he can explain um, what he went through to uh, obtain the quotes and kind of what Fo and Son has done for the town and, and will continue to do under, uh, under PERMA. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, a brief introduction. My name is R.G. Fistato. I'm a town resident, and I specialize in insuring West East municipalities. That's what I do. Um, it's a very brief about Slow and Sons, a company I work for uh, for the last 28 years. Slow and Sons is an independent insurance broker, independent meaning we're not owned by a bank or a financial institution, and we're not public for a private company. Uh, we believe that's important in terms of keeping. Um, the independence part, um, giving the advice uh, free of any stockholder pressure. Um, as Robert alluded to, um, the town has a workers' compensation insurance policy uh, in uh, anniversary of July 1, 2022. Uh, very briefly, what workers' compensation covers is two things. Uh, one, if any of the town employees gets injured on the job, it pays uh, their medical expenses with no deductible and no maximum. Um, second item it pays is if the employee's injured employee is out for a period of time, um, it also pays a portion of their salary. So that's the two main things that workers' compensation covers. Um, I'll take a break for a moment. Any questions at this point? Excellent. Um, so as Rob um, talked about, about 30, 60 days, about 60 days ago, I spoke with Rob and Jill and uh, outlined the current program with the State Insurance Fund, um, expressed the interest in um, staying with the State Insurance Fund and or getting another vote. Um, Rob and Jill both uh, authorized me to approach PERMA 
Um, Perma is a insurance reciprocal. They're, they specialize in uh, New York State uh, workers' compensation for municipalities. That's all they do. Um, so Rob is correct in terms of um, their service and claims uh, handling uh, has always been uh, very good. Even when the town was with uh, Perma uh, years ago, it has not changed. Um, for the current year, um, we negotiated a quote with the state insurance fund, uh, and then we negotiated three separate quotes with the uh, PERMA. Um, the three year, three quotes from PERMA, one quote was a one year term, the second option was a two year policy term, and then the third option was a three year policy term. Um, I would say that up until this morning, we did not have a three-year policy quote. The PERMA um, tends not to like to give three-year quotes. If it's too far in the distance, um, it's a commit on their part, um, and they do come through with a three-year quote. Um, the challenge is the state insurance fund is probably moving to. Um, the state insurance fund the pool that the uh, town is in because they have very low claims is in the preferred part of the state insurance fund. And what the benefit of the preferred part is you have municipalities that have lower than average claims are all in the same group. And everyone in this group is um, eligible at the end of the year uh, if the group does uh, profits to get a dividend. So that's a check back to each member based on their premium. So um, this um, dividend is not guaranteed, has been paid for the last, I think, 31 years, give or take, uh, consecutive one. Um, um, if we want, Rob and Jill, if it's okay, do you want to zoom in right to the, um, the PERMA three-year quote and then go over the state insurance fund for a little? Yeah, you can do that, RJ. That's fine. Very good. Um, so in column uh, I's and E war, um, it's a three-year policy uh, with PERMA. Uh, it's important to know that the policy, um, if the town is to cancel it midterm, has heavy financial penalties. Um, so it is a commitment on um, the town's part. The town has been with PERMA for, and I would tell you, in my 28 years of doing this, how these permits have not changed. Um, their, their service is still very good. good. Um, the um, the, the Perma quote uh, for three years uh, in year one, and then where I'm looking at, if you have it in front of you, it's um, I-16. Um, RJ, they, 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 don't have they don't have that spreadsheet, so I prepared ah, okay. a, a memo. Okay. Um, um, and I, I gave them the specific quotes that you gave me, the quote sheets from I, uh, each entity. Terrific, terrific. Do you have any questions about the quotes from each entity that can answer? And one thing I want to point out, RJ, about Perma's quote, you mentioned is a substantial penalty. I, I um, One of the reasons we are recommending the three-year plan, I don't see any reason that we would pull out and, and change uh, carriers in that period of time. But one of the things it does in this three-year plan as I'm reading it is it kind of locks in our top end here. So uh, we had a period of time where we escalated at probably 25, 30, in excess of 30 percent over the years that we had some bad claims. Um, we're locked in. So our claims, our, our premium in year two, if we have a loss ratio less than 30 percent, which we've had sub 10 percent over the last, I don't know how many years, I think almost the entire time, Mm -hmm. We've been with uh, state insurance fund. We've had below 10%. But we need to remain below 30%, and we get a 5% reduction over the next year. Uh, if our ratio is between 30 and 50%, the rate stays the same. And even if we go to a loss ratio 50% or higher, um, we have a 5% increase. So we're locked in at a 5% increase if worst-case scenario happens, and, and we haven't been that bad since 2013. And again, with the training that both PERMA provides, that FOA and SUN provides, um, the attention to detail that our staff now has, uh, I'm not looking at that. Do, do you mind just explaining what exactly that means? In other words, what, what sort of training 
wasn't done before that's being done now to avoid workplace injuries? And what kinds of injuries were we seeing to have such a bad rating before that? Sure. So um, some of the injuries that they prevent, um, Foe and Son actually comes down and does trainings in person down with our DPW. They talk about, uh, they review the loss runs and they look at what particular types of injuries occur, I, I believe not just within the town, but that they're seeing over their whole body of work. And they explain how to prevent those slips, trips, and falls. What types of things do you look out for? Um, we do that in particular at DPW, but, uh, and, and the police, but we also have them in town hall too. And we'll run courses on um, winter driving, um, uh, uh, walking around town in the ice and the uh, snow and ice and those types of things. RJ, maybe you can talk about some of the other uh, training programs that you've offered. Right. Let's not forget the ergonomics that we that we did, um, yep. where we had um, Nicole come in. They examined every uh, employee's workstation to make sure that they were sitting properly. The monitor was at the right height. Um, there, uh, you know, there are these little gels that you put under your wrist to make sure that the, you know, doesn't affect your carpal tunnel, that you're sitting properly. We got new chairs because, you know, we've got people that are, you know, you, you've got Ike who's sick something. I had to raise the desk for him. And you've got, you know, women that are staff that, you know, are unwell under five feet tall. They can't fit in the same chair. So when they had been, we had, did, didn't have adjustable chairs. So stuff like that. Um, the other thing that, that um, Fo and Son did for us is that they didn't just go through the injuries. They went through um, frequency of injuries. So if you repeatedly got hurt, they identified you as someone who needed additional training. And they tried to figure out what it was that you were doing that caused you to keep getting hurt. Um, and we were really serious about this, so that if it meant that you always had to be with safety glasses and you kept forgetting them, if you went out and you didn't have your safety glasses, there was a counseling memo in your file because we, you know, one of the promises we make to our staff, it's sort of implied, is that they come to work in one piece, they should go home in one piece. And, you know, if something's happening in between and, you know, you're being too careless about the way, you know, you're treating yourself, you're leaving safety equipment behind, that won't be tolerated. Yeah, I, I would say that's combined with discipline, too, yes. on the part of management. Um, Very much so. And there's just one more point about workers' comp. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to go on on it. But workers' comp is apples to apples. There is no deviation. What The, the coverage that we get from New York State Insurance Fund is exactly the coverage that we get from PERMA. It is state-required. So unlike your you know, liability insurance, you know, automobile, there's a little tweak, a little deductible, a little bit this, a little bit that, that doesn't exist here. So the coverage is exactly the same. And I think we've been very proactive, too, when somebody's out for an extended period of time. We have quarterly loss run meetings, so we actually look at the injury and we review the notes on the case, make sure that they're attending the uh, medical exams, et cetera, so that they can return to work. Um, not sure if we were, well, we, not sure if that was done as diligently in the past. Um, so I think, you know, it's a multi-pronged approach to, um, to have reduced our claims. And uh, our claims history is pretty phenomenal lately. And it is. Basically what we're doing is we're paying, a, we've been paying a premium and, and uh, not really realizing. <laughs> yeah. Which is good news, but, but um, which is why, you know, state insurance fund, if you look at the actual premium quote for them, um, it, the actual quote is high. It's a dividend where they give back. Um, so the perma is kind of, we're not paying that premium in the first place. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Sounds great. Thank you, RJ. Thanks, Thanks RJ. Thanks, Thanks RJ. RJ. Thanks, RJ. You're welcome. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> dismissed. Watch the rest of the meeting if you want to. <laughs> Otherwise, you dismissed. My mom's calling you. She's in Hawaii. They, they want to visit her. The time zone change. <laughs> Good night. Bye. Good night. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So why don't we take a, a ten-minute break or nine-minute break uh, before our nine o'clock uh, public hearing? So can we, we don't need to do anything. Can we just, Carrie, can you just put something on saying we're taking it? Uh, yeah, we'll just have recess up. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back from our recess. Uh, we are going to start right up with the public hearing. Uh, we're right on time, look at that. Uh, so we are going to open uh, our public hearing regarding a local law to amend Chapter 60, Section 210 and 410, Section D, uh, Subsection D of the Code of the Town of Newcastle concerning sign regulations. Uh, can I have a motion to open the public hearing? I move to open the public hearing. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, Ed, anything you want to say in before we start? Uh, no, only that uh, though we are still waiting for the mandatory uh, uh, comment referrals from the Westchester County and the Newcastle Planning Boards. Uh, so we wouldn't expect the county to have substantive comments on a, oh, I take it back to respond. It just, uh, I didn't have, it came today. The county's response, and as predicted, uh, they do not have substantive comments. Uh, but we may well receive some substantive comments, that's pretty funny, from the uh, Newcastle Planning Board, and uh, we need Carrier to pitches. wait for them until uh, the public hearing can close. Right. Okay. So um, just for everyone listening, we are not then therefore closing it tonight. We are going to leave it open until we, uh, we receive those comments, which should be sometime mid-July, I believe. Uh, the next planning meeting is July 5th. Okay, perfect. All right, so then um, before we take public comment, we did, if you sent in comments online, we have your comments. They're part of, of the record, and we've all read them and seen them. Um, one change I would like to suggest we make, and uh, I think we talked about it last time, but um, is just to make sure that it clarifies that when it says that a sign can be open, can be up for 30 consecutive days, it should be immediately preceding the 30 consecutive days, immediately preceding whatever event that is, because I don't want people to take advantage and say, oh, it's only up 20 days, and now we're going to take it down for five days and then put it up another 30. So it can only be up for the 30 days immediately preceding an event, and then it needs to be down within the prescribed amount of time. So, I don't know if anyone has an issue with that, but I would propose that that be in the revised uh, legislation. Any thoughts? I, that's fine. I yeah, thought it was sense. clear by saying it would yeah. be down three days after, but that's fine. Yeah. I, I did too, but apparently it's not. That's fine. <laughs> All right. I don't, I don't think your, your oh. microphone's on. Got it. Okay. All right. So then why don't we uh, open it up to public comment? Is there anyone here who'd like to speak on, on the uh, proposed law? Sure, come on up. I just, uh, if you could just say your name and address. Uh, I'm Anna Walker, I live over on Crutzville Road, and I have a kind of a miscellany of small comments and then a, a big one. Sure. So uh, the first one is I think that uh, it's very, the very small first comment is, uh, in the paragraph defining temporary signs, there's a part that says, um, including but not limited to blah, 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 civic, philanthropic, not-for-profit, not for charitable, etc. Um, it's missing a hyphen. You need not-for-hyphen-profit. Right now it just says not-hyphen-for-space-profit. That's a good comment. I'm not a lawyer. I don't know how I could twist it, but somebody could. <laughs> um, okay. Um, three feet above the ground is, is, is it referred to. I wonder what, what, um, what the people like in Hunt's Place what what if they have can they put signs on their balconies that are 40 feet up or 30 feet up or whatever how does that work the three feet off the ground is speaking to a safety concern about putting the signs in the right of way um, I'm not sure it has so application it to what you're describing on a balcony okay so it doesn't it doesn't it's not literally anywhere they can't be they have to be three feet off the ground it's just in, in, when they're I, well, in the public way. That was um, our building inspector had a few comments with regard to public safety for any signs, and the thought was anything taller than that could impact sight lines on any roads anywhere. Right. So that was that thought, as was the five foot setback. So it could block you, like if you're driving a car or something. Exactly. Okay. okay. Um, um, and then the, the 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 one about contiguous town to town property. Um, it, it just, uh, I, I wondered 
if that was fair, because that seems to me like it, you could read it, you could read it that if I live next to Gedney Park and my, my property abuts Gedney Park, then I can have my signs all along my frontage and then I can go right into Gedney Park. No, what it's meant to get at <laughs> is if you if you think you're putting a sign on your front lawn, right. okay, there are setbacks. Right. And those are different depending on what street you're on, where your setbacks are. Right. So what we thought we were we would do was just simply unify it right. with the input from our building inspector with regard to safety to just say you don't have to go measure if you're technically four and a half feet off or if it's seven feet off. We're just saying in front of your home, which is why we said contiguous, right. the front of your house on the street side, right. not the Gedney Park side, <laughs> um, five feet is sufficient. You don't need to go take out your survey and measure are you really four feet or are you really eight feet. Five feet was sufficient. So that's what that was meant so, to be. So does the language need to specify that then in front? We thought it did. I don't think it says the word in front. It just says contiguous. I'll take another look at it. It could be signed. If you live on a corner, it could be the right. If you live on a corner, it could. And then um, there's a, there's part where it says um, identical temporary signs may not be placed closer than twenty feet from one another. Um, I think there should be a better definition of identical because to me, it, maybe it should say uh, instead of identical, it should say signs promoting the same cause or event because you could you could read that to be you know one sign could be vote for Joe and the other sign could be Joe says vote for me. They're not identical, but they're for you know the, the same pe the same event or cause. Mm -hmm. Um, but the main thing I really, really am shocked by and surprised by is that this, I feel that any, uh, any a, a discussion of rules about temporary signs has to discuss materials. I am surprised that you have not put something in, I hope that you will put something in, specifying that they have to be made of cardboard or paper. This is the stuff that they're made of. This is from four years ago. My son had it in Minneapolis. It's, it's, it's plastic. This is what most of these signs are made of. It will last for, you know, till the earth blows up. And it just it, you, it needs to get thrown out. They're garbage. They cannot be recycled. Are those are the corrugated? This is the corrugated. It's we recycle corrugated plastic. all of ours, just so you know. They use them for bee key, for, for bees. They use them for a lot of different things. We recycled every single one. Okay, well then, then, then they should, then they should be, they should, there should be something, some language that they can be recycled. But, but even I think it's probably, I don't, I, I haven't looked into the details. So, so I guess, I guess you know, this may be, it may be equal whether you're recycling paper or cardboard or you know, plastic. But I, I suspect that it's, you know, that paper is more sustainable. And also, if you put up paper or cardboard, it's going to get, it's more likely to be. Um, start decaying within the t within the thirty days, so it'll you know sort of be a self fulfilling. <laughs> anyway, that's that's it. Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Good Thank Thank you. You. Those are really good points. Any other comments here? In the peanut gallery. Okay. Uh, any comments online? If anyone's interested, please raise your digital hand. Uh, Cynthia Seamus, please unmute yourself. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Hi, Cynthia. Just a quick question. Um, I'm very curious how many comments the board received via email regarding this legislation this week. I don't. I don't have a count of that. But I can say many mirrored the one that you you put the form language in there. They were pretty balanced, though, I thought. It was... They were. We had, did get them on both sides. I don't have a count for you. I think there's probably more that are opposed, but in total, maybe, what, 15 or so? 20, maybe, in total? It wasn't. It wasn't a ton. 15, 16, something. Yeah, around a dozen. Five times as many as last week. Okay, okay. thank you. you. I'm just guessing. I don't have it. So, so I, I, the reason that I'm asking the question is that last week the comment was made that there were only three or four public comments, and so the town must be in support of this law. And I thought 
that was really pretty frightening to hear. And that's why I sort of Cynthia, that is that not level. what was said last week. What was said last week was given that we weren't hearing a lot of public comments, we didn't need to hold the public comment period open any longer. We did not say it means the town is in favor of it. That was your interpretation, but that was not what it said. I urge you to go back and actually listen to the meeting if you'd like to hear. Mm -hmm. At any rate, I'm glad the residents are commenting about it. Um, and uh, hopefully once this is all settled, people will stop doing things like entering my private property and removing my signs. Okay, thank you very much. All right, anyone else? No other hands right now. Okay, last call for today. All right, well, then I would say um, we adjourn this public hearing and leave July it open 12th. until July 12th. I, I think the 12th. it should be. Right after the planning board. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so can I uh, hear a motion to close this public hearing for to adjourn this public hearing? Adjourn. Adjourn. Um, to adjourn this public hearing until um, July twelfth. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so now we can just move to our administrative items. Okay. Rob, you want to take them? Okay, just, um, we've talked about it the last couple of meetings, um, I think previously, um, we had the IT hardware upgrade and replacement and the Microsoft Office 365 migration, and uh, that adds a multi-factor authentication. Just wondering if anybody has any questions regarding those. Uh, we're going to replace three servers, uh, firewalls in a couple locations, and some wireless access points throughout town. That's the hardware refresh. That makes sense. Yep. All right. Um, and we've got resolutions. So I think we have resolutions. We do have some resolutions. Yep. We just got resolutions. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, Chris, you want to start us out? Uh, so. <laughs> Payment of claims. Um, I move to approve the payment of claims in the amount of seven hundred and seventy-five thousand nine hundred and seventeen dollars listed on the summary pre-check writing report and detailed voucher detail report, both dated June 17, 2022. Checks will be cut and mailed to each claimant listed on Thursday, June 23, 2022. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Authorization to hire PTA recreation attendant chat. I move to authorize the hiring of Lisa Tiso as a part-time availability recreation attendant for the Chappaqua Performing Arts Center at the rate of $30 per hour, effective June 27, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 One more. Yep. Authorization to hire part-time recreation attendant at the Arts Center. I move to authorize the hiring of John Gonzalez as a part-time recreation attendant to serve as an Arts Center assistant at the rate of $15 per hour, Effective June 27, 2022. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Sarah. Sure. Authorization to hire uh, 2022 camp counselors for recreation. I move to authorize the hiring of the following individuals to the position of recreation attendant within the Recreation and Parks Department to serve as the 2022 camp counselors in the corresponding rates as described below. Effective June 27th, 2022. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Authorization to approve workers' compensation coverage. I move to approve workers' compensation coverage with the Public Employer Risk Management Association for a three year term beginning on 7 1 2022 and continuing through 6 30 25. The premium for the 2022 2023 coverage year is. $304,582 with a $25,000 broker placement service and training fee 
due to FOA and SUNS for a total cost of $329,582. Coverage in subsequent years to be determined based on the town's loss ratio each year per the attached quotation. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, I move to authorize the purchase and installation of various hardware and software improvements as follows from logically consisting of replacement of town hall servers, water treatment plant server, uh, water treatment firewall, and wireless access points at various points throughout the town for a total cost of $72,759.09 and from Dell Technologies for the purchase of um, laptops um, towers and monitors as more fully described in uh, resolutions at a total cost of $13,905.66. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, I move to authorize the purchase and installation of Microsoft Office 365 and multi-factor authentication from logically at a cost of $17,424. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, I move to adopt a local law to authorize members of all public bodies to the town of Newcastle to participate in public meetings via video conference, as well as adopt the video conferencing policy set forth. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Uh, anything else? We have a meeting on July 12th, right? Yeah. Okay. Just check. We'll be doing on the 5th. No meeting on the 5th. We are, our meetings for uh, July are the 12th and 26th. 26th. Yes, and then we've got one August 6th. Whatever that Tuesday is. Yeah. Yeah. That Tuesday. Okay. Okay. I may not be here on the 26th. So I'll be doing the video conference that we just approved. All yes. right. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? So Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.